have no idea where this will lead us, but I have a definite feeling it will be a place both wonderful and strange. Diane, this is Khalil. It is currently 8.14 p.m., and I find myself in an environment of isolation due to COVID-19. If you notice any particular discrepancies in the quality of this recording, it is because I've had to pursue alternatives to get this message across to you. As Teddy Roosevelt once said, do what you can with what you have where you are. Oh, and I almost forgot. With me today is the black coffee to my cherry pie. Wait, I'm the black coffee? Yeah, I think you're more coffee than I am. No, I'm definitely sweet and you're bitter. Okay, I understand that and appreciate the compliment. But at the same time, I don't like coffee. (laughs) Well, then there we go. (laughs) I'm going to I'm going to forfeit all my (laughs) Twin Peaks points and say I don't actually like coffee that much. So I just gave it to you because I don't like you either. (laughs) It works perfect. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, boy. Well, pleasure seeing you guys. This is the Unplugged Professor. Uh, Hope you guys are doing well surviving out there. Yes, me too. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> Me too. Very <laughs> eager. Um, this is our first episode we've recorded uh, in actually about like a month, a month and a half uh, since COVID-19 hit. Yep. I know that's dating this podcast a little bit, but honestly, if you're listening to podcasts, any podcast recorded this time is probably bringing it up. So I don't feel like we're alone in that matter. I I think it may have been about two months, actually, because we are about eight episodes in uh, seven episodes from the series, then the pilot. So, yeah, it's been eight weeks worth. Um, yeah, it's it's crazy. It feels good to be back doing this again, um, though, very separately. But because we're doing this a little bit different here, if you notice any audio differences, just want to let you know that's why um, this episode is going to be a little bit different also than our usual. Um, we'll go back to our normal formula with season two in our next podcast. Mm-hmm. Uh, but this episode is going to be more of a season one reflection episode. We're going to alternate between trivia on the series so far and a bunch of different topics that we've come up with. Plus, we get our own personal cozy spaces instead of being crammed into one singular microphone. Uh, Khalil now has his own microphone to enjoy and all the arm space he can want. I, I like how you're saying arm space, but I have my arms clenched tightly in front of my computer desk. <laughs> I'm actually no more able, but thank you. Um, <laughs> and I looked up all the trivia on Twin Peaks just to keep the unplugged professor spoiler free. Um, all this trivia is from either the Twin Peaks wiki IMDB or uh, an amazing book, uh, Brad Duke's Reflections and Oral History of Twin Peaks. Uh, I can't validate, you know, every single piece of information here, but I thought those are three relatively reliable sources. Uh, And then also... Damn it, Khalil. The people need the facts. I hope they're the facts. I hope they're the true facts. But in Twin Peaks, sometimes (laughs) the mysteries are very deep. Um... (laughs) Five topics we'll be discussing today. We're going to talk about our top five favorite characters, five least favorite characters. I already told the Unplugged Professor prior to recording the spoiler that all five of my favorites are James. So I look forward to being able to tell you that. Uh, Two. You heathen. Two. We'll talk about our top three favorite scenes and moments from season one. We'll rank our season one episodes from best to worst or worst to best. And then uh, look at season one as overall, its strengths, weaknesses. Do we think it holds up today? And then lastly, we'll end on our hopes and predictions going into season two, um, which should be uh, very insightful, especially again, considering Unplugged Professor. uh, This is your first time seeing season one. Uh, I'm very excited to hear your overall thoughts. Mm -hmm. Um, So as far as uh, season two goes, uh, will I also continue to be strapped to a chair, eyes wide open as I have to stare at each individual episode and record thereafter? uh, Clockwork Orange style? Um, I mean, a lot of people like to compare Stanley Kubrick and David Lynch, so I feel like that's fair. Um, I, I think, th- I think if it's, if, if, if it's for what the fans need, I think it's a small price for you to individually pay, um, you know, for the fans, <laughs> for the fans, <laughs> we do this for you. We do this for you. So to get started, uh, I have some general trivia that doesn't necessarily fall into one episode. Uh, it's more overall. So first off, uh, this was something that we had talked about briefly, but I didn't actually know the full information on it uh, is how much time has actually taken place in season one, because I feel like a lot of times we're watching Twin Peaks. We can't tell how many days have actually passed. So the plot of season one takes place over one week. Really? Um, 
Yeah. And it's again, this is really trivia in the sense of like it's a secret. It's just if you actually like look at it, the pilot, uh, the pilot started on February 24th, 1989. That's the date it's in the show. And then the season one finale uh, is supposed to take place Thursday, March 2nd, uh, which goes into the a.m. hours of Friday, March 3rd. So it literally is from Friday to Friday. You know, it's something that it's hard to even consider the time length. I think that one of the benefits with uh, Twin Peaks is that it has a very uh, dreamlike quality to it. It's kind of just like continues on and on and on. And you think like there's this bigger or smaller gap of time depending on the situation. And... Yeah, no, a week is surprising to me. I think that any response you could tell me for the length of time in Twin Peaks will just outright surprise me. It actually has only been five minutes. Cooper drove in and it's all been five minutes since he got there. Five (laughs) whole minutes. Oh, oh God. Rosenfeld was really on like a time crunch to take care of that freaking body then. (laughs) Yeah, Doc Hayward didn't understand. We need to go fast here. (laughs) No, I I completely agree with you. I I didn't have any idea going in if it was going to be a week or more. I knew time is weird here, um, but I think a lot of it also is the way it jumps between perspectives. You know, how much of the screen time are we actually with the investigation with Cooper and the the sheriff and the police? And how much is it, you know, with James and Donna and Maddie or with Audrey and the parallel plot lines happening over at Ghostwood? So I won't say it makes normal sense. Like, it definitely feels like longer than a week to me. Um, Mm -hmm. when I think on it at the same time, I think that dreamlike quality you mentioned also the overlapping timelines, it makes sense in a way, even if it's still very unusual. (laughs) Um, also interesting, uh, supposedly some famous fans of Twin Peaks include American President George H.W. Bush, uh, Russian Soviet President uh, Mikhail Gorbachev. And Queen Elizabeth II. And there's a story I found out about uh, when reading that she couldn't stay to listen to Paul McCartney perform on her birthday because she would miss Twin Peaks airing that night. So she (laughs) told Paul McCartney, I have to go to Twin Peaks instead. Uh, That is beautiful. Um, I can uh, I can honestly see it. I can honestly see it. It's like I'm a little bit ashamed that George W. Bush didn't uh, didn't check in after his dad watched it. I didn't find him in the research. So W might not have done it. Like, when did T- Twin Peaks sort of just pop up? Uh, again, around that early 90s time frame, like 91, 92 in the area. OK, so, yeah, with like a lack of video distribution or anything that kind of could be handled in the back. Well, I suppose maybe like s- someone amongst the queen might understand how a VCR and recording would work out. on. T- <laughs> I like to believe that the British royal family, their technology at any given point is 10 years ahead of time. Like, I like to believe that, you know, they already had that stuff. Uh, I also like to believe that George W. Bush has since then. And now that it's been on physical release, I like to believe that George W. Bush has the gold box edition that he's he's watched all the episodes of the log lady intro. I I like to believe that. Um, Uh, That's beautiful. That's just beautiful. And then one interesting piece of information about the soundtrack. Uh. There's this story about when Angelo Badalamenti, the main composer for Twin Peaks and just in general for David Lynch, when he was writing uh, Laura Palmer's theme, uh, this is how Angelo Badalamenti explained it kind of in first person. He said, David sat Mm -hmm. next to me as I played and said, this is David Lynch saying this, imagine you're alone in the dark woods and you hear a soft cry of an animal or an owl in the background. There are sycamore trees blowing in the wind softly and the moon is out. A girl appears behind the tree and pauses for a moment. She's walking towards you and looks into your eyes. And then Angela Badalamenti says, we did one take. I said, I'll go home and work on it. He said, Angelo, don't change a single note. You could see the hairs on his arms were standing up and his eyes just became a little salty, if you know what I mean. And then David Lynch said, Angelo, this is Twin Peaks. I can see it. And Angelo Badalamenti says that was it. It became Laura Palmer's theme after that one take. Uh, I can only imagine two things on the top of my head when like he's trying to describe that. For one, how did I give piano in the middle of these woods? And number two, <laughs> when the woman is brought up, I kind of wish that there was a sense of he would go roll for initiative <laughs> like he was just a secret RPG nerd. Yeah, right, right. Uh, it's, it's always interesting to me to see how much David Lynch relies on chance and just kind of his gut in the moment. Um, some things are methodical, mm-hmm. sure, but uh, definitely a case where he tapped into someone's wavelength and just rolled with that. Um, I think 
I think that that also is sort of like uh, the nice little thumbprint he leaves behind. Uh, I think that it is very important for his style, if anything, that he does mm-hmm. take these chances, whether they do benefit or not. It's still going to be something memorable enough and for people to think this is Lynch. So, yeah, I admire that. And to bottle Amenti's and to bottle Amenti's credit as well. He's someone who's worked with Lynch now for a few years. And by this point, he's able to tap into what Lynch is getting at. You know, very few mm-hmm. people can listen to David Lynch and know immediately what to do. <laughs> so I think that that's <laughs> impressive in of itself. Fan uh, freaking fantastic. Two more pieces of general trivia here. Uh, this one, I, I debated including it or not, but I don't think it's a spoiler in, in any sense. It's just something that might get you thinking. I haven't heard it yet, but I'm excited to hear it. Might get you thinking. Okay. Um, supposedly, actors were not told if they had killed Laura Palmer, meaning that many actors have reported not knowing if their actors were lying or not in scenes. So that means that in general, people weren't being told if they did it or not. <laughs> now, that's not to say anything about. Well, that's because no one killed Laura Palmer. Right. That I, Exactly. But that meant that no one <laughs> knew that no one did it, though. <laughs> <laughs> so I just think that's really interesting to think about that they didn't know if they were lying or not. <laughs> no, I think that that's a good way to add a layer of deception uh, in just because that just makes the individual seem more competent or masterful inside of their abilities to lie. Uh, so, mm-hmm. no, I think that was a smart decision overall. But still, no one killed Laura Palmer. Laura Palmer is alive <laughs> and Cousin Maddie is dead. This is a hill I will die on. <laughs> well, or Laura will die on it, depending. Um, and then the, the last thing here, this is more just to follow up with something we'd mentioned before. Uh, I, I brought up how we listened to the Log Lady introductions before the episodes, and I wasn't sure when they were made or who made them. Uh, looked up yeah. on that, and uh, they were made by David Lynch. He wrote them, so they are all written by David Lynch, and they were for the 1993 reruns that aired on the Bravo network. Huh. So... Shortly after the show was done, they were written by David Lynch, um, probably around the time that the uh, film Fire Walk With Me was being made and released. So if anyone's wondering about authenticity of the Log Lady intros, they're straight from the horse's mouth. If the horse is David Lynch. Well, then to David Lynch, I have to say bravo, uh, pun absolutely intended, as those Log Lady intros are... A very nice sense of ambiance, if n- not to grip you with the strange messages she gives, even just like ignoring the messages and kind of going in with a flat line brain sense, just kind of like hearing her lull on and speak really gets you ready to watch Twin Peaks in my senses, if you will. Yeah, if you're listening to this and you haven't watched it with the Log Lady intros, if that's something you're able to do, I would strongly recommend you check them out, um, especially if, you know, if you've never seen them before. I think they're very valuable for a first time watch, but also for repeated watches, too. Absolutely. I remember that um, I had to go through it a couple times just because overall just the sound alone is just something intriguing. And then I completely skipped out on the words, uh, got more used to it as time went on. But it still is a very enticing uh, portion of Twin Peaks that I think is essential for the viewing. And it does so much for the log lady, because I, I, we've mentioned a few times in the podcast over season one that she barely appears like <laughs> until she shows up and like talks to them in her little ho- house. We hardly see her at all. <laughs> Maybe that could be both a pro and a con, because, again, you do see more of the log lady. But at the same time, you see more of the log lady. There's almost a strange sense of charm on the initial uh, presentation of season one that there's just this strange lady in the woods that people just know and refer to as the log lady that just says a few ominous things and they go off on their way. So I can I can see uh, a measure on how both viewings of the log lady can be good and bad. It is really interesting to think about because when the show was originally made, they didn't feel it was necessary to have these intros, you know, like the the um, the original work of it didn't include them. None of the other writers or directors felt it was necessary. And it's interesting because David Lynch just kind of it sounds like on his own pretty much added this. And it makes me wonder, you know, if David Lynch had had total control of season one and season two before, if he had been the writer and director in every episode, is this something he would have just wanted to include had he wanted to do this the whole time? But 
he just didn't get around to it. I'm, I'm curious on the process because, you know, you're right. It, it, it kind of demystifies her in some way because otherwise we see her maybe once in the pilot and then once at the double R, you know, my one day my log will have something to say to you. And then you don't see her for like four episodes <laughs> and she just becomes this weird, reclusive, unknown entity mm-hmm. who you can make certain guesses about, but don't know much beyond that. Yes. Whereas the intros set her up as David Lynch's mouthpiece. They mm-hmm. set her up as like, this is the theme person. This is the person who tells you theme. Um, and there's good and bad about that. It kind of relegates her to being, again, the theme person. I don't know. It, it's interesting to think about either way. It is. Uh, I, I would say on the measure of like what was deemed necessary, not like the log lady intros may be for many eyes, including those of staffing uh, found unnecessary. But there's also not a necessary need for two pillows. I'm just more comfortable with two pillows. This is an extra layer of padding in which I find a lot of relief and enjoyment from. So, um, yeah, okay. I'm, I'm just relatively glad that at the very least, the options available. Um, a good case for the Blu-rays is that you do have the choice between Log Lady intro or not. Just note that Khalil and I are pro Log Lady intro. I just like the idea that every time they released an entry, they should have had someone else do intros for every episode so that later we'd have like Leo Johnson <laughs> intros every single episode. Just Leo Johnson telling us his important wisdom and advice. And it, it, I like the idea that he's talking to Shelly in the intro, like where the camera is Shelly. So he's just like, you know, Shelly, it's very important that you smoke this brand of cigarettes, you know, just like staring at the camera really intensely. <laughs> <laughs> just more so like he is actively trying to show fondness for Shelly. But at the same time, just like that is just misdirected like this. Like you remember the scene where he's just like, don't worry, Shelly, I'll take care of James. James won't come between us. Wasn't that Bobby? Wasn't that Bobby who did oh, that? Oh, I'm sorry. I was thinking about the wrong person. Yeah, Bobby with. Yeah, uh, no, I, I didn't. I don't know. If, I don't know if I trust. I feel like if Bobby tried to do intros, he would just like use the opportunity to get on his soapbox and like he wouldn't be able to fit what he has to say in the time frame. I think I think he would just start like <laughs> preaching at us about the hypocrisy of the town and yeah, how nobody truly cared about Laura. And the, yeah, he would do something. I But Leo, he's he's a. Uh, Leo is, if anything, he's very to the point. <laughs> mm-hmm. He's not a man of many he words. He gets down <laughs> off his soapbox, proceeds to get the soap and give soap to everybody. <laughs> In his own Leo way. We're sorry. Uh, <laughs> In his own special way. Oh, oh, oh uh, what about an intro with just the log? Just the log sitting there for like a good minute and a half ooh, before the episode. Ooh, that'd be good. <laughs> That'd be very, very good. Uh, Let's go into our (laughs) top five favorite characters. Um, I'll have you go ahead and start, Professor. I don't know if you want to start with number one or start with your start with five. However you want to do this. Okay. uh, very well. Well, with the top five characters, uh, I'll go with number five, Jacques. Uh, Jacques Renault uh, was an excellent, I I would say, antagonist Force. He definitely was a hench person, but at the same time for something for uh, Cooper and the gang to oppose in a sense. And his overall acting was fantastic. Jacques will be definitely memorable, especially from the last episode of Twin Peaks. Like he immediately shopped up to the top five characters on my list. Thanks to the finale. So you mean very he, he happy. jocked up? He jocked up to the top ah. of the list? Ah, ah, ah. Uh, no, I think I, I agree with you. I think it's incredible just um, how much of a presence the character is given with the small amount of screen time he has. Absolutely. Uh, he's built up very, very well. And again, I kind of think of him how most is like in, in video game terms, like a mini boss, you know, a very memorable mini boss. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Uh, number four, we'll go to Dr. Jacoby. Dr. Jacoby has uh, layers <laughs> and uh, like a coconut. Uh, you <laughs> you yeah, like uh, you got the uh, like the rough outsides, the meaty insides and the coconut milk, it, which he literally is made of as well. <laughs> Don't you talk about Dr. Jacoby's <laughs> meaty insides to me. No, uh, Dr. Jacoby is fascinating. I mean, he is a therapist based character, not only with complicated relations with good old Laura Palmer, especially with the little necklace and his little coconut with the mannerisms he had uh, stroking about his tie and the tapes that he's had. But there's also that additional layer where he's just blatantly saying that, look, I really 
uh, I'm just not really into this whole entire biz. And Laura Palmer is the thing that kind of gave me a little bit of life back. Um, it, it, it's fun to see a supportive character that at the same time is almost against his sense of support and seeing how he'll continue to unravel maybe in his own sense of madness since he cannot see past a wig um that we'll see more of or maybe it's the fact that he did see past the wig because cousin maddie is laura freaking palmer uh, but yeah, that's just me. I mean, if you if you're worried about him having some sort of mental collapse, you, you could back it up with the idea that he does kind of have a split perception. You know, he looks at the world through two different colored lenses, mm -hmm. red and blue at the same time. You know, are those mixing to create the full spectrum or does that mean he's kind of having a schism? You know, <laughs> is there a sense in which he might be viewing it in a split way? Mm -hmm. uh, interesting. Yeah, no. Cool. Yeah. Dr. Jacoby's definitely fascinating. and I look forward to hearing more about him as time goes on. Uh Top number three, Hawk. Ah, oh, okay, okay. Hawk is, Hawk, Hawk is generally just a fun and exciting character. Um, that not only is his lack of flaws um, interesting and concerning, but he's just generally a fun guy to just see on screen and just some of those small moments. That high five is probably just a scene that might have not stood out otherwise, um, just like them just walking up to him. But no, Hawk is just generally a cool, friendly guy that's very reliable, gives you a sense of wisdom uh, whenever he has a chance to do it. He's just fun, and I love fun. So, yeah. So you're saying you don't want the Breaking Bad spinoff where it goes through the corruption of Hawk and uh, how he becomes this degenerate, terrible person. Uh, we'll talk more about that uh, later on in the uh, later sections <laughs> of this video. But, OK, curious. Um, OK. We, but <laughs> next up, we're going to go into number two, Audrey. Audrey is. OK. Yeah, Audrey's utterly fascinating in uh, how she sort of handles herself um her overall breakdowns and laughter are fun to just kind of like dig at and just kind of come up with your own interpretation uh and she is definitely a driver of the plot she keeps things going moving and interesting especially with uh the perfume counter so overall very excited to see what happens uh especially at the beginning of season two or if we're just gonna suddenly forget that i'm gonna be like oh how did we end up here um and number one to come at no surprise james james hurley <laughs> I will end Hit you. Hit the James button. <laughs> I will end you. No, uh, number one is uh, Dale Cooper. Dale Cooper is <gasps> just a fun personality. He is infinitely intriguing to just kind of go about with layers. And I can imagine that there can be about a thousand different ways that people can talk about Dale Cooper. I personally would like to sit down with uh, who was it you said? Uh, Queen Elizabeth II? Yes. Yep. I would personally like to sit down with Queen Elizabeth II and just talk about Dale Cooper. I think that we both would have fascinating things to say. Excellent. And to viewer, viewers out there as well, if you happen to be a viewer of Twin Peaks and or the Queen of England, uh, feel free to tell me of what you think about Dale Cooper. Uh, you can reach us at our email at... So it's snake eye dreams at gmail.com. And our Twitter handle is at snake eye dreams one, the numeral, the numeral one. As opposed to the le O N E, like as opposed to written out. It's the new it's the numeral. <laughs> that just sounds like we're some strange, like arranged facility. Okay, but <laughs> you know, just like <laughs> prepare for snake eye dreams two initiative to start. Uh, okay. Um, <laughs> I'll, I'll go through my top five now. I'll follow your lead with the starting with five. Um, my number five is Audrey Horn. Um, I put her on there for much the same reasons that you did. So the reverse two. Hmm. So the reverse two, five and two. Sure. Um, Audrey was my two. Audrey is your five. Well, wouldn't it be one and five would be reverse? Because then no, look, look at the number two. And then, oh, reverse oh, it. There we go. Okay, that depends on the font. Okay, that depends on the <laughs> font, you heathen. Um, Audrey Horn's <laughs> my number five for the same reasons you listed her very highly. Um, she not only is, you know, our secondary protagonist, basically, she 
is such an interesting character, I think, for what she brings to the table in her background, in her family, her the style in which she manipulates and moves throughout, like the different social environments she's in, like she's someone that's kind of like Cooper in the sense that she's weird, right? Like she's a weirdo. But I feel like whereas Cooper, everyone just kind of like knows it, doesn't say anything, just kind of looks at each other like, OK, I guess we'll do this. I guess we'll go with this. I feel like Audrey somehow gets away with it very consistently. Like when when she's just like dancing to the music that may or may not be hearable to everyone else. Donna just kind of like watches and lets it happen. Um, like no one seems to question Audrey, her bizarre existence. Um Again, looking at her her family history as a descendant of Benjamin Horn and her mother, we don't see the mother very much, but enough of we've seen of her family dynamic with her and Johnny to know that Audrey has grown up a little bit differently. Uh, her weird situation where she doesn't really seem to like Laura Palmer that much really wasn't that close to her, but also claims to have known her possibly the best. Um And just how willing she is to just go headlong into things uh, in a very... Uh, individualistic, stubborn manner. And she's not like a, you know, clear cut, 100 percent good person either. I mean, she's just kind of an agent of chaos, you know, uh, and our first impression of her is her just ruining things with the uh, the Norwegians just for giggles. And uh, what will happen if I remove this uh, this pencil or pen from this cup and all the coffee will spill and all these papers um, just kind of a entitled, you know, brat character but one who's taken to a different level the moment she's introduced to Cooper, the FBI, and the sort of, ooh, a form of escapism and mystique. So Audrey's my number five for the reason, those reasons. Um, yeah, she's absolutely someone who can definitely play around with her environment and have a, a lot of her own personal sense of fun uh, while doing it. I think that she is a good uh, comparison to Dale Cooper. If anything, I would love to see almost like a Dale Cooper and Audrey style buddy cop spinoff coming this summer. Uh, uh, but, yeah. I, I would only be OK with that if it's like a comedy like Rush Hour. So like one of the two has to play like <laughs> this kung, like like dad, the Jackie Chan character. Uh -huh. <laughs> I want to I see that spinoff right there. It, oh. It's not even just like it's not even just a spinoff of its own. It's just like literally replacing uh, the two main yes. ac actors of Rush Hour and just recreating the movie. But with uh, yes. Audrey and Dale Cooper. Perfect. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, yeah. Um, Audrey, hmm. I'll have more to say later. Anyway, please go Perfect. on. Perfect. Uh, my number four is exactly your number four. That is Dr. Lawrence Jacoby. Good choice. Good number. I have I have less to add here just because, again, uh, we, we you already said so much about him. Uh, I think he's such a memorable and unique character. In any moment he's in, they gave him these very specific quirks such that you can always, there's always that sense in which there's more to Jacoby than what we know, right? Like he he obviously he doesn't have like the one thing like the log lady does. He has Hawaii, but the way in which he talks about Laura, the way in which he talks about his feelings on the town that he just doesn't really doesn't care. Like people trust him with their thoughts and feelings. But at the end of the day, mm -hmm. he doesn't care. Uh, there, there's obviously more going on in his head and his heart. And I think that what also sells me is when he tells Cooper that, you know, this on this investigation will be ongoing for the rest of his life for him. It sounds like that goes beyond just even if they find a killer, it's beyond mm -hmm. that for Jacoby. Um, there's there's more to him than what we initially think, like the way he acts. It seems like there's always more to his character and more to his story. Um, and he's just an interesting. He's a fun person, like the, the, the stupid trick he does with like the golf balls when he's being investigated, the the way he just dances around questions. But then he'll immediately just be like, no, I, I wasn't one of the men that night with uh, Laura. He, he has just an interesting demeanor that he can drop and control. It doesn't seem like he's controlled by his weirdness. He's in control of that weirdness. Like, I think he knows what he can get away with and what he can't get away with. And I almost wonder with Cooper if he lets his weirdness show a little bit more, mm. <laughs> you know, because it's Cooper. Mm -hmm. um, my number three is Benjamin Horn. Um, okay. Benjamin Horn. Uh, he is. So explain why you're a horrible person. <laughs> Um, Ben Horn is as much of a plot driver, I would say, as pretty much anyone else. Uh, he is not a protagonist character necessarily like we see with Audrey or Cooper, but 
so much of the events of season one, he is the puppet master, even more than Catherine, even more than Jacques, right? Other characters who are leading things in the background. Ben has got his hands in, in his thumbs in so many soups, all the thumbs and all the soups that all the I, thumbs and all the soups. I, I feel like Ben Horn, the fact that he like kind of is getting away with everything like he <laughs> He sets up Catherine such a perfect way to betray Josie, but then to go to Josie and use her, use Hank, use Leo, use everyone. And at the end, at least of season one, uh, we don't know the fate of Catherine. We don't know the fate of anyone involved in that fire. But the mill was burned down. Um, he, he ended up getting what he wanted, presumably. And presumably Josie got what she wanted out of the deal. And... He does this all while running, you know, one of the bigger establishments in the town with the Great Northern Hotel. It's where Cooper lives. I mean, so symbolically, he owns the the place that Cooper spends his nights. He's kind of like the powerhouse of the town. And yet he's also just as involved in the limelight as he is involved in the underground crime element. You know, he now, he, mind you, he does. Mind you, he does not get everything he wants, though, because Catherine was given the uh, little sheet to sign off on oh, yeah. her will. And she does her not life sign insurance. It. Yep. Yeah. No, he doesn't get that. I, I will give you that. But but at the end of the day, he's coming out on top so far. Uh, mm -hmm. More than I can say about a lot of characters. I think that his manner of speaking, his his use of, you know, these sort of highfalutin Shakespearean uh, vocabulary that he seems to have. You know, contrasted with when he's with Jerry, for example, this sort of relatively. I wouldn't call Jerry normal, but but uh, much more grounded individual, I guess. I, I, <laughs> even all the as I'm saying these words, I feel like they're lies. But um, yep. no, you're, but, you're pretty much right. Uh, but ben David and Jerry contrast. episode. <laughs> yeah, I, there's a lot I could get into, but just overall, I think the amount of presence he brings, how much he is pushing things behind the scenes. And I just enjoy moment to moment when he's interacting with people, the way he's the way his posture is, the way he gestures. There's just something very um, uh, unique about him, I think. Uh, my number he's two. Proper, he's a proper antagonist for the series. Uh, he's a proper gentleman is what he is. Uh, <laughs> number two is Bobby Briggs. Um Bobby Briggs, uh, I've talked a lot about him over the season. Uh, I don't know if it's any surprise to people who've noticed me talk about him that, yeah, I, I really, really enjoy Bobby. Um, we'll get into more of why when we get to some of the scenes we'll talk about later. But Bobby comes across at first as kind of, at least to me, as this reckless, you know, teenager character who, you know, has a mild... Well, I shouldn't say mild. He's like run drugs. It's pretty severe. But um, compared to like some of the more, you know, explicitly malevolent people like, you know, abusers like Leo, you know, people who are running the drug uh, stuff like Jacques um, or even Ben with his arson and all the plans behind the scenes or, or uh, Hank. Bobby kind of stands as someone who's on that edge. You know, he's be he's between two worlds, one might say he's between the world of of sort of this criminal underbelly of Twin Peaks, but also is part of the normal world where people like Shelley can live. He He's not quite um, far gone, but he's also not quite fully redeemed either. And I think the portrayal of him as that is actually one of the better portrayals of a morally mixed character in the show so far. Um, in that Bobby has a consistency of character that. I don't always feel like he's upright, moral or doing things that are, you know, evil of the woods. Bookhouse boys need to stop him kind of territory. But we have Bobby as someone who is looking out for his own interests quite genuinely. I, I think the relationship with Shelley um, and the way he like morphs it and like, you know, Shelley, I don't know. I, I think Leo might be selling drugs, <laughs> you know, when obviously he's involved in it. You know, I'll take care of James. Don't you worry. Uh, I don't think anyone was worried. He's just doing what he wants to do in that moment. And it's causing mild amounts of chaos. But he's not like, you know, Audrey going on this uh, this this in over her head sort of territory. Bobby is somehow just making this work, at least so far in season one. Um, his his relationship with his father, his his uh history with Laura, the way he opens up about his emotions or doesn't open up about his emotions. I think there's just so much complexity to his character. Um, and plus, I mean, he hangs out with Snake and uh, while Snake's not one of my top five, Snake and Bopper, it's classic. It's classic. It that is definitely a 
Definitely a choice bit of classic. He is very uh, chaotic and selfish in his own rights, but I think that that only makes him all the more interesting. So uh, you've already went with two uh, incredibly um, like not so good individuals. So I'm excited to see where your number one lies. My number one is the worst of them all. FBI agent Dale Cooper, the absolute worst of them all we can all agree <laughs> oh no not dale cooper <laughs> yeah you can't trust that man i tells you i mean i i feel like it's such a predictable answer that you know we both said it but i feel like the vast majority of people who watch twin peaks this is going to be their favorite yeah almost everyone and of course you know not everyone don't mean to exclude people but cooper is handled so well by this show i'm someone who normally doesn't like the protagonist the most like I'm usually someone who likes the side characters. Um, and there's various reasons probably why, but generally protagonists just seem kind of boring or flat a lot of times. Many protagonists are written in as a little bit of a placeholder for someone, just uh, yeah. someone that's very identifiable. But uh, Dale Cooper is his own entity. Right. And we talked about audience surrogates way back in our pilot episode and concluded that we really didn't have a good one. You know, the closest we came up with was, was the sheriff. Uh, Dale Cooper resists the idea of just being someone we're supposed to identify with. We, we don't I, I don't think we identify with him <laughs> unless you have a very specific interest in Tibet. You don't identify with Dale Cooper <laughs> unless you like use dream methodology to solve murders and then forget the name of the person who did the killing the very next day. You don't relate to the guy, which I think is, again, very interesting. I also make sure that my home gym includes something in which I can just have all the blood rush to my head just so that uh, all of my most important dream muscles are up and ready for my observations. Yeah, no, I, I love Cooper. I think he's a very standout, memorable protagonist. I think he's. He has these moments of bizarreness. But it also comes through so well when he has moments of sincerity. We, You and I both like the way he handled uh, the conversation with Audrey when she shows up in his hotel room. Um, there's a sense of sincerity and, and childlike wonder to this character that uh, I think is very endearing, but not done in a way that makes him seem just like a goody two shoes. The way his face lights up in the pilot when he's like, you know, doing you know, checking inside of people's fingernails and like doing like really crazy stuff. Mm -hmm. He he's at home in this darkness, but it seems like it hasn't touched him. Mm -hmm. You know, like there's a sense in which he he's he's maybe playing with fire, possibly. But uh, he, he's wearing those oven mitts like he told Hawk to wear. You know, <laughs> <laughs> that's what you do, right? If you wear oven mitts, fire can't get you. That's that's the metaphor, right? Yeah, you know, uh, oven mitts. Don't oven burn. mitts are fireproof. Yep. Um. Um, is a proofing or resistance <laughs> that stops fire? I think those are important details to consider, considering all the fire. <laughs> fire retardant. Fair enough. Um, bottom five. Um, why don't you go ahead and start, Professor? OK, here are my bottom five. Uh, number mm -hmm. four is going to be Leo Johnson. Um, for Leo Johnson, he is a entity of just frustration, anger. He's a driving force, but I really can't say that much about Leo Johnson other than he's just kind of a wait, jerk. Wait, why'd you start with four? If, if it's top, bottom five, isn't it five, four, three? Leo Johnson is just very um, frustrated at everything, and he's just probably going to try his best to get his own way. Um, I hope that we get to see uh, a more sides of him in the following season, too, though he seemed the most dead out of any other individuals. <laughs> so maybe we won't. So you actually don't like Leo, huh? You actually I don't. think he's one of the worst characters in the show. That's interesting. I didn't actually know that about your perspective. N now, mind you, these bottom ones aren't necessarily in a sense of hatred or anything like this. This is just more so on the lower tiers. Um, but does he diminish the quality of the show for you? Like, do you think it'd be better without him? <laughs> no, no. But the thing is, is that Leo Johnson is a hurricane. He is just a force of nature that moves about. So I can't really say much on his quality of character because all I know is that he is a hurricane. And he will rock you like a hurricane. I really hope Leo Johnson does not rock me in any sort of way. That is <laughs> my preference. Thank you. Uh, uh, I mean, I've heard people talk about his acting. Um, and I have to acknowledge, even for Twin Peaks or David Lynch actors, his acting in season one, especially in the pilot, 
it's a little off, but I don't necessarily have a problem with off acting. In general, Lynch uses that a lot. So mm-hmm. I don't really have a problem with it. He does seem like very unrealistic in his acting, but also just as a character. I've I've uh, noticed other people expressing the opinion that they're not really intimidated by Leo because he just seems like kind of like a loser. He doesn't actually seem that threatening of a person. Well, it's the kind of the aesthetic of the show it acts like a soap opera and having someone as a clear like angry force is not something that is necessarily too surprising with that we even see the little parodies of the very angered forces in uh invitation to love with that guy with the eye patch so Mm -hmm. okay so you're skipping five and you did Uh, four i did four now number three is uh-huh. uh, Cousin Maddie slash Laura Palmer. OK, Do you, see, you see, you see there, you see there, there's five I people there. in this list. Khalil. Oh, so you're going to count that as Patience, two. Khalil. So you're going to try to lie about the rules here and you're going <laughs> to. There are no established rules. I am free to be. I am this Bobby you speak of. OK, so the twin, the twin peaks of Laura and Maddie. Go ahead. Yeah. The twin uh, vessels of the story, uh, Twin Peaks, that, that literally on the Blu-ray, we see a cracked picture of Laura Palmer with the dead corpse of potentially Laura Palmer. Still think it's Cousin Maddie. I'm more interested in the elements of these characters than anything that has really come up with them. Now, mind you, there's plenty of horrible things done with Laura Palmer, but it's so vague and... I'm almost just more intrigued by the people she affects more than her herself. She thinks that she is this force that uh, if she could, if she didn't have this sort of strange power, maybe things would have been better. Um, Whether or not that was afflicted by her lineage, seeing as her mother has visions, or if this is just a effect of Twin Peaks itself. It just makes everything around uh, the character more interesting than the character themselves. The most interesting thing about Kaz and Maddie is that she is the twin aspect to Laura. Like, they look a lot alike, and uh, she is affecting James. Um, So, yeah, as far as these characters go, it's just... I'm not hooked yet, and it seems like the story is even putting it... Even though we are still progressing it, it feels almost like on the back burner. Uh, Twin Peaks progresses in a way in which uh, it starts off with the importance of Laura Palmer and everything that's going on with her and then slowly fades into the B plot, which the B plot becomes more of the A plot, uh, where we're focusing more on the lumber mill. It's uh, interesting. Twin Slopes, I would have to say. Again, Twin Peaks is a very fitting name, not only for the city, but how the story is structured and how uh, characters can compare to one another. So, yeah, uh, Cousin Maddie, Laura Palmer remain at number three of the bottom simply because I think that they better affect other people than I can ever say about their characters. So, you know, Professor, I, I heard everything you said. Yes. And it sounded coherent. And I'm sure many viewers will find your arguments persuasive and interesting. Um, Thank you. But I I must remind you that James Hurley did tell us that Laura Palmer's hair is soft and she smells so good. So that kind of characterization we haven't got from anyone else yet. No one has been described in such terms in this show other than Laura Palmer. I mean, as far as it goes, I can only assume like uh, Ed's poof is pretty soft. So um, I don't think that uh, James was as close and intimate <laughs> to Ed. I think Pete smells amazing. <laughs> <laughs> Probably smells like fish all the time. But <laughs> hey, if you like fish, he's your man. Um, if you're if you're OK with that. Yeah. <laughs> if you like the fishy smell and taste of your coffee, Pete's your man. Um, uh, but yeah, a good transition because number two okay. remains with James. James is a okay. character i was gonna say if it was pete i was gonna fight you <laughs> <laughs> if that was if your transition oh i hate pete i, I hate. will fight you because i don't understand that and you know what the response to things you don't understand is combat <laughs> there's just something too fishy about that man Ugh. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah uh no james hurley is it, it, this is a character that 
has complications, but I think the execution trips up more than anything, whether or not it is the sense of direction or acting or anything like that. I've had plenty of complaints yeah. seeing James, um, even in his own small intimate moments, uh, where he admits uh, more details about his mother, uh, when he is talking with uh, Ed and Nadine being like, yeah, I'm not going to the funeral <laughs> and proceeds to go to the funeral. See, I find it funny. I almost find like that's that's my complication with James at this point. <laughs> he's bad, but he's also funny to laugh at. <laughs> yeah, that doesn't make him good. Is, but that's that's the question of like, is there such a thing as so bad it's good in the sense of if James's character is so dumb, unrealistic or just cheesy, but it adds an element of enjoyment for me as the viewer. Doesn't that kind of mean he's an interesting or funny character? Kind of, even if it's not a result of anything, quote unquote, intentional, if we could even know what the intent was behind James. I don't know if they were trying to make James cool or not. <laughs> yeah. If that helps you with your sense of validation, by all means, um, for me, I feel validated up to the tip of validation. <laughs> <laughs> Go on, go on. For me, when it comes down to James, it's, again, he's just humorous at times. He just has his tendencies to try and be a character, but he's not there yet. Um, he, he just seems like he's almost to that point in which I might be interested in him, but oh well. Uh, leading on to my, my number one, I had the hardest time with this because uh, James was actually vying between the first and second spot. Okay, I can only imagine who the next one is. <laughs> uh, the uh, number one is James again. I decided to put him in two spots. <laughs> no, no. Uh, it's uh, actually going to be Donna. Uh -huh. I The thing with uh, James and Donna, not only uh, am I just generally like eh, on their overall uh -huh. relationship or anything that goes on between the two of them? Uh, the difference between James and Donna is that James is a person who's got on screen time. We've got to learn more about him and we dig deeper and deeper into James. Donna hasn't had much opportunity to really shine outside of the couple first episodes and otherwise she's kind of more of a background element so i'm i was thinking to myself what is worse a character that is just over uh utilized plenty but n not really gaining any points from me or someone who doesn't even have the chance uh <laughs> to really gain those points and i think that i just decided that yeah the person who's not really playing the game and just yeah. kind of standing on the sidelines the is probably the one <laughs> Yep, she is the bench warmer of this trio uh, between uh, cousin Matt. Whereas James is just a bad hitter. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, just just but he actually gets to hit. <laughs> yeah, the big crew that are meant to really drive the Laura Palmer story being James, Donna and cousin Maddie are in my top three worst uh, inside of this. Yeah. So whatever that tells you of my viewing of Twin Peaks. Well, and by proxy, by proxy, Laura's yeah, in there. Yeah, by proxy, uh, because she is there. She is holding the uh, Cousin Maddie <laughs> neck at the moment. <laughs> okay. Uh, interesting. My list is actually quite different, so this is going to be fun. Uh, I approach this as more the characters I think are the weakest, which means that... Is it also going to be that you're going from the number five to the number one as well? I'll go to number five, yeah. <laughs> so... So I uh, I don't have any double up cheating like you have. My mine are all individuals. There was one I almost included, and I'll and I'll mention it when I get to the person I kept instead. I originally had two people together, but I counted them as only one, so I wasn't trying to cheat. Um, but I looked at this more as the characters I find the weakest. So you you went a little bit differently. I think both ways of approaching it are valid. Uh, so my number five, the not the worst, but the fifth from the worst, is Joey Paulson. Uh, the bookhouse boy who we know the name of, he was, he's made like, I think two appearances in the show, but they have done literally nothing with him. He is a named character who exists only to basically say, Hey, <laughs> and pick up Donna. Does that mean that, uh, unnamed characters are going to be higher on your list that are underutilized? So spinning locker man is going to be the number one worst. I, I do. They have to be a character. They have to be a character. And my thing is that spinning, Lo spinning locker man is a character. Okay. He has plenty of character to him. I don't view him as a character. No, I think he's a gag. I think he's a he's a he's a funny joke. Um, I would say that Joey Paulson and part of it also goes into what I think there's potential. I think the potential of having another bookhouse boy character 
is interesting in of itself that I wish they did more with the Bookhouse Boy concept in season one. I understand you could argue that they just introduced it. That's enough. But I guess I'm interested in Joey Paulson enough to like he could have done something with him, uh, at least give him a quirk or something. So he's memorable. He's just kind of there. Um yeah, there's just no Bookhouse Boys uh, really present other than being like, hey, uh, Cooper, let's go see the Bookhouse Boys. Uh, they go over there, have a small conversation. And that's basically it. My number four is along the similar lines. Uh, Bernard Renault. Um, for how good Jacques is, Bernard is there for like five minutes and then he's gone. And again... I understand your argument that like no named characters are even less relevant, but there's something about having a character who should matter a little more and just nothing is done. That's interesting. And again, I'm not saying Bernard Renault needed to have like, you know, 30 minutes of screen time here by any means. I just think that compared to Jacques, he's such a lesser quality that it's just kind of here's Bernard and then they kill him. I, I feel like they could have done something even after he was dead. They could have given some like retrospective characterization. Um, but, you know, more mild on those two. I don't think they're necessarily like dragging the show down for me. Just more of like, you know what? They had a little missed potential. That was about it. Mm -hmm. uh, my three is originally I had two people on here. Uh, I was going to put Eileen Hayward on here with Sylvia Horn because the, the both in the sense of um, the mothers in a family where the husband and the child is a big part of the show, but not the mother. However, I realize that, you know, I don't think that um, Eileen Hayward, Donna's mom, needed to be anything more than she was. Because the way Donna's been characterized, I don't think knowing the mom would really matter that much, to be honest. Um, so I removed I removed Eileen. I, she's not one of my least favorite five. But I kept Sylvia because I feel like we, we get what I think two scenes with Sylvia, one in the pilot where she's yelling about, you know, why won't Johnny come down for breakfast as though she hasn't lived with Johnny her whole life. And then the one where she says almost nothing while Jerry comes in and eats baguettes as they talk in sexual manners about uh, the girls by the river. Um she just kind of exists. <laughs> yeah, exploring the family dynamic would have been a fun plot point, I think, just because for the most part, we just kind of like get a few seconds of silence from her, if anything. And again, with none, I'm, none of these, I'm saying they need to be a major character. It's more just that for how interesting and important Ben and Audrey are, I understand not having as much of Johnny. Johnny's kind of a problematic character in general. I mean, is his inclusion in any way benefiting the show or is it harming i know some people think it kind of ages the show poorly because at the end of the day why they put him in a native american headdress you know just because they wanted to i mean it's part of the weird factor i think sometimes the weird factor can get a little exploitative so johnny i don't think needed to be anything more or less than he was just knowing that there was a child with severe special needs in the household and that audrey has been living in this unstable environment and i think it works but I feel like Sylvia, as the other side of the coin, should have had an extra one or two scenes that give her more or at least references to her. I just feel like she was very underutilized as the third ingredient, you know, in a potentially interesting mix of, you know, how did Audrey become what she is? We're all we're kind of left to speculate due to absence. That's all we really have. Um, my second to worst is Donna Hayward. Um, and I won't repeat things you've already said. Uh, I think that. Donna, when I first watched the show, the fact that she was the best friend of Laura, but immediately the day Laura's body is found is making out with James. The way in which she goes to her mom about it and like her mom's just like, no, nah, it's cool, fam. You can you can be with James. You know what? Invite James over to dinner. I know the death just happened yesterday, but like, just do that. Um, it all kind of just surrounds Donna in the sense of like really weird, forced romantic subplot to me. At least that's how it felt when I first watched it. And throughout my rewatch of season one, it just feels very, eh, I've never cared about Donna. I don't feel myself brought in. I think the angle of Donna of, 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 of Laura's best friend is really interesting. Like you would think in a story about Laura Palmer, the best friend of Laura Palmer would be very important. And yet how little Donna's actually contributed. And once Maddie came into the scene, Donna's done even less. Like Donna's been such an absent character. And, you know, again, maybe they'll do something with that in season two. But for season one on its own, like if the show just ended here, What's Donna contributing? 
you know? Um, well, you said before that uh, your first viewing, you didn't really like it. The sec uh, the next viewing with me, you were like, eh. So maybe uh, if we just keep watching season one again and again, you'll end up really loving Donna as well as the relationship that forms. It seems <laughs> to be some sort of rising action here. My mind will become so numb and become as mush that I'll love everyone. <laughs> I will just I will attain nirvana. I will have attained true enlightenment and I will just love everyone in a, in a non-attached way. It'll be great. Um, <laughs> might be a controversial choice, but I stand by it. My least favorite in the sense of the most missing potential is Ronette Pulaski. OK, interesting. She was the other girl who was with Laura, presumably the night everything went down and Laura died. She is introduced in the pilot is basically someone wandering out across the bridge, gets gets in the hospital and basically goes into a coma. Right. She's conscious enough to make it across the bridge, goes into a coma. But while she's there, Cooper just like starts talking to her. And of course, like in TV format, she's able to miraculously respond to Cooper before she falls back into her state. And in that moment, she really doesn't convey anything that important. It's just kind of a, a it's it's her situation is used for dramatic effect. But. Throughout the rest of season one, so little attention is paid to Ronette that I can't believe it because they're investigating Laura's murder. Right. She's the one who's dead. But Ronette was there. Why are they not investigating more to Ronette? And the one that gets me is that when Hawk was talking to Ronette's parents, who only appear in one scene, he sees the one armed man who at this point he's had no reason to like think is behind anything. He hasn't heard about Cooper's dream yet. You know what I mean? Yeah. But he like ditches the parents of Ronette to go chase down this random one our man going off to the morgue, which I understand it's suspicious to do. Sure, but they never revisit that. Ronette's family doesn't matter. Ronette doesn't matter. And it's crazy to me because if she was there when Laura was there, shouldn't she be just as important of, of finding clues? Shouldn't she be just as much of a focus? And I, I just uh, I, I find it hard to buy. Well, she's inside that coma. So clearly uh, we will have to wait about three more seasons. But her family isn't <laughs> until they have. Well, I imagine that whenever it comes to like parents, they have no clue what their children are up to. What, what do we know? Anyone who's really uh, connected to their parents other than just, I guess, Donna. Donna was the most open with her parents and she was the most accepting. Well, there. Well, the, the father works at the lumber mill. Yeah, but we have to focus more on the lumber mill. The father works at the lumber mill that ties into that. I guess the thing at the end of the day is we don't know anything about Ronit. We don't know if she had friends. We don't know. And again, if you're investigating the situation, you're looking for suspects, right? Why aren't they digging through Ronette's contacts to find who Jay could be? You know, obviously there's a linkage. Why are these two the ones? I don't know. I just think it's very bizarre that Ronette is a one and done kind of deal. And I feel like it's a little silly at best like silly is the nice word for having this character this teenage girl who was presumably possibly sexually assaulted almost killed put into a coma and all they use her for is this moment of sudden clarity where she can mumble very vague ominous things and then go back into a coma and not be used for the rest of the season i just uh I don't know. It doesn't sit well with well, me. Well, I look forward to season four when she finally breaks out of that coma but it is far too late uh <laughs> um yeah, I, I can see where you're coming from onto that. Uh, it seems that at the at that time, Ronette is mainly just a sort of uh, clue for people like uh, mm -hmm. Audrey to continue on with her investigation uh, because Ronette's name was one of the names found inside the little black book towards uh, one eyed Jacks. So, hey, maybe uh, I'm being hopeful since uh, Audrey has found an in to a one eyed Jax uh, that will be able to explore Ronette more as time goes on. But hey, time mm -hmm. will find out. Right. And the hope would be that any of these characters, you know, would have some development that'd be good. Uh, noticeably, I did not put James in my bottom five. That does not mean I love James. Right. I, I still would put him <laughs> rather low. But for, for me with James, it's come to the realization that I find him funny enough and it's just so stupid enough that I actually enjoy him more than Donna by quite an amount. Mm -hmm. Donna hasn't done anything that I find funny or interesting. James has. OK, he's contributed a lot of cheesiness, and a lot of silliness. Don't get me wrong, but it's memorable stuff. Yes. Again, that moment during the funeral where it's like, I'm not going to the funeral. Yes. And then he, he just got there. He says that and he immediately leaves and then he shows up at the funeral. <laughs> I. And the, the way is he's got such a big forehead. You know, there's so many things to love about James. Uh, 
his forehead, his attention to hair detail, yeah. his uh, lies. Yeah, sure. I don't like him very much, but I, I, I have an appreciation now. I've grown to have an appreciation, <laughs> even if it's not anywhere in my top like 20. Um, like I've told you, just keep watching Twin Peaks and he will reach that point. You'll love everybody. Wow. We looking at the time. We are already an hour. That's crazy. Um, so. Yay. <laughs> we just yeah, we, we, now I'm on the pilot trivia. <laughs> trivia for the pilot. <laughs> all right. Well, no, I in all seriousness, though, we knew going into this, this could be very short or very long. Uh, I hope that, you know, we're creating something here for the listener that they would enjoy. Uh-huh. This is by no means indicative of the rest of our episodes. Uh, this is something kind of special and fun. And again, we haven't got to do this in so long. Mm-hmm. We just want to talk about Twin Peaks. And if you're here to listen to us, we're probably going to talk another hour. So just, you know, <laughs> we've had so much build with Twin Peaks. And hey, with all the notes I've already taken with season one, who knows how long our pods are going to get with season two. Ooh. It's like, yes, this connects to there. And this color phone connects that that color phone yeah lucy thank you um pilot <laughs> pilot trivia uh this is something we've talked about quite a lot and i have something to say uh again how verifiable all this is i told you my sources at the beginning take it with a grain of salt but the population of twin peaks is listed on the sign as fifty one thousand two hundred and one. and i've told you before it doesn't feel like that and you've tried to play devil's advocate a little bit and try to defend it but Rumor has it that supposedly... Yeah, because I've looked up at things like uh, town populations and so on and dealt with it. That's still a small town. Like, 50,000 is a low population. But supposedly, Lynch and Frost had wanted the town to be 5,120, but ABC told them that was not what they wanted for the show. That was too small and unrelatable of a town. They wanted it to be a little bit bigger than that. It was, it was too unbelievable if it was a small town. Now, that seems silly to me for ABC to decide that. But it's, it's I'm torn between, OK, why would ABC not be OK with the 5000 people town? At the same time, I'm also torn because it does feel like a 5000 person town to me. And I know what you're saying, that town size can be deceptive. I fail to believe that there is more than one school in, in Twin Peaks. I fail to believe with the way everyone knows each other. That Laura Palmer's death would be like this if it was 51,000. And I understand that a lot of things are already weird about Twin Peaks. It's all possible. But in my heart of hearts, I will always think of this as a town of 5,120. I think that overall with uh, just having Laura Palmer be this big of a person and adding an extra zero to that 5,000 makes it all the more weird. So I welcome the weirdness of that. Uh, I think that definitely does set a strange tone and precedent on who Laura Palmer was amongst this community. Uh, Straight up, Mm -hmm. even to uh, people from Dr. Jacoby to the priest to Bobby to basically anyone uh, Laura Palmer had touched in her life. So, yeah, um, I'm not harbored against like that size of a town and overall i still think that from the moment to moment whenever we're going to different venues i don't think to myself man if only there were more people here no it just it makes enough sense to me that there's enough populace at the double r or there's Mm -hmm. enough populace at this little cabin um this next one is something uh we'll probably end up talking about if we ever sit down and do a, a watch of the international pilot which is not on the plan for right now. But um, one thing we had questioned in our episode three podcast was, uh, well, actually, our uh, our third podcast on episode two of season one, you get the idea, is... Uh, <laughs> it's going to only get worse from here, folks. It's only well, going to no, get actually, worse it was, from it here. Actually, it was episode three. Okay. <laughs> I'm talking about after Cooper's <laughs> dream. So Cooper had the dream in episode two. It was in the third episode. He talked about it the next morning. He was recounting details that we didn't see in the dream, and you and I were wondering about that. Uh, I did want to just mention, because I feel like people are you know, might be listening to our older podcasts and like it's glaringly obvious to them what happened. There are things that happened in the international pilot that got worked into the dream sequence that we saw in episode two. And some of the scenes that were cut from the dream version are implied to have still happened. Now, the confusing thing is that someone who is watching Twin Peaks on TV who never saw like the international version because I don't believe that version would have aired on ABC at the time. It would have been the one we saw and then the forward. They wouldn't have known about the cut content. But anyone who sees the international version, they'll see that stuff. So in the international pilot, he has the dream that in the show doesn't appear until episode two. 
But along with that, we have extra stuff involving Cooper, Harry, Lucy, Hawk and Andy. There's a scene where like um, Mike's more involved in different ways. Stuff that Cooper brings up in his conversation. It didn't come from nowhere. It came from a cut content in the international pilot. OK, that's not really a spoiler. I don't want to say too much about it because I think at some point we will watch the international pilot. I think it'll be a fun exercise like later on. Mm-hmm. But I just wanted to mention for anyone who's curious why we were confused on that. Uh, there's stuff that's in the international that's alluded to, but isn't in the you know non-international. Yeah. Um, this is something we might have mentioned, but I think I didn't dive into it as much as I should have. In the end of the pilot, we have uh, the figure of Bob, of Killer Bob, appearing for a moment in the mirror at the end of the episode. And I had drawn uh, your attention, Professor, to that just so you noticed it, because it's a, such a small detail. Yeah, um, it's a fun detail. And I might have told you, I don't think it ended up in the pod, though, is that that, inc- that was an accident, right? Like, um, the character of Bob is played by someone who was a set director at the time and got caught in the mirror in the background. So I don't think I mentioned that in the podcast, but in case you didn't know, yes, one, Bob appears in the pilot at the very end as a reflection in the mirror that Sarah Palmer, like, stares forward when this happens. And... Uh, that that whole thing was an accident because basically David Lynch found out, oh, yeah, we have to do reshoot this because, uh, you know, Frank was in the in the mirror and David Lynch was like, no, <laughs> that's, <laughs> that's great. great. <laughs> Keep it. And then he made he made this character. Um, we don't know if he always had a Bob in mind, but he made Frank Silva as Bob in season one afterward. That. Interesting. So um, curious things, but just thought I'd mention that to you. Um, and then this one kind of blew me away. So again, I have trouble believing if it's true, but supposedly in the original pilot of the script, Audrey had no lines of dialogue. Um, now how late into the process that is, you know, when, when, what do they mean when they say original pilot script? I don't know. But again, between the, the book I read, IMDb and Twin Peaks wiki indications that Audrey might've been a non-existent character, basically in the pilot. Hmm. Um, which she's not a major character in the pilot, but she's enough of a presence that it sets her up for Uh season one. So that is very curious that Audrey's character was initially not really there. That's sad. It makes you wonder how much Audrey was a focus for Lynch. You know, if Lynch wrote and directed the, the pilot, was she a character he planned on making as big of a deal as she became when other writers and directors got involved? I don't know. Um, yeah, honestly, uh, whenever it comes to production, it's definitely wonderful and strange on how even just small happy accidents can grow into something all the more enticing later on. I think that um, adding those elements of good old Killer Bob, uh, <laughs> as well as just expanding upon Audrey, no, th- th- these are fun decisions. Mm-hmm. Uh, for episode one trivia, um, I got a couple things here. Um, Longtime viewers of David Lynch's films will know that the character who plays uh, Pete, Pete Martell, the actor Jack Nance appears in pretty much everything David Lynch makes. Okay. Uh, Jack Nance was the main character in Eraserhead. He appears in smaller roles. And if I'm wrong, I apologize. But I believe in Elephant Man, Dune, Blue Velvet, Wild at Heart and Lost Highway. I don't think he appears in the musical Industrial Symphony number no. one, but he appears in pretty much every feature film um, up until his unfortunate passing in the late 90s. Uh-huh. Um, uh, but he was in everything Lynch made. And uh, so Jack Nance is kind of, you know, he wears a lot of different hats for for Lynch. Um, but what's interesting about his character of Pete Martell is that so he's married in the show to Catherine Martell, right? Yes. Um, but what's interesting to know is that in real life jack nance was married to a woman named Catherine e colson oh. and the thing about that is that that's the log lady <laughs> <laughs> so real life jack nance was married to the woman who plays the log lady yes uh, by the time twin peaks was airing they had they had separated they're no longer married but they were actually pretty close friends still like they weren't like it wasn't a bad divorce by any means okay. they had they had repaired their friendship at the very least but what uh, what Catherine Coulson would say is that the way Pete says Catherine in in Twin Peaks is basically how he would talk to her. <laughs> so uh, anytime that Pete is talking to Catherine, it's like Catherine, you know, that's how he would talk to the actress who played the log lady. That's beautiful. That's just beautiful. 
And again, it sounds like they were both on good terms. They just felt like they got married too young, didn't really know what they ran into. And, you know, um, that's what happened there. But uh, just a fun little thing if you didn't know that those actors were connected, because in the show, we don't see the log lady and Pete talk. You know, they don't really interact much. And that only makes me more curious, because when it comes to like um, like Pete's actor, it was it more so of a situation in which uh, David Lynch is just like, ah, come on around. We're about to shoot something. I think you'll enjoy this. Or is it sort of sense of like, hey, Lynch, uh, do you have any sort of special products that uh, you want me in? Wink, wink, nudge, nudge. Um, so, yeah, I'm, I'm kind of curious about that dynamic. There's so much you can make with naming in Twin Peaks. I think it's curious that of all people, the character that Jack Nance would be playing is married to someone named Catherine. It's almost like Lynch knew he could get a more accurate, yeah. <laughs> a more emotive response if he's talking to the name of his actual former wife. It's a little crazy. Um, it but, is a little crazy, but at the very least, it's entertaining. Yeah. Uh, the second thing I had on here for episode one uh, is more about the actor for Benjamin Horn, um, which is uh, Richard Boehmer. Richard Boehmer, this is what he was. He was talking about uh, working with the actress who played Catherine. So Boehmer said uh, working with Piper Laurie, that's the actress, was like working with a diva. And then he was describing the scene where they're in the bed together early on. I think it's like episode one or two. Um, he says she didn't want to do the romp in the bed and she was making all sorts of reasons why that couldn't happen. I couldn't do this. I couldn't do that. Finally, I got off the bed and said, Piper, can I at least kiss your toes? She said that would be all right. So that's why I kissed <laughs> her toes. That's not how it was written. We were supposed to be just really devouring each other. Yeah. Um, and Piper Laurie was interviewed. She was talking about uh, him, Richard Boehmer. She said that when there was the joke about little Elvis, that Richard Boehmer didn't appear to understand the joke. So the kind of the huge irony of the guy who's playing, you know, horn dog number one, Richard, ba you know, the Benjamin Horn, who seems to have yeah. uh, his hands in everyone's pants, you know, uh, doesn't yeah. actually pick up on the dirty jokes he's making, <laughs> you know, that are in the show. Um, that's just I just think that's really funny as their dynamic. <laughs> <laughs> all right you know? all right now that just gives more credit to ben's actor yeah and the kissing the toes thing came out of necessity for the actress um <laughs> which you know i think it worked and i think the the, the original did. choice they're supposed to be devouring each other that also feels very in character if that would have happened i think that if uh, we, they were just going crazy uh at one another and devouring each other as it were uh it probably would have less of an impact for me i think that just just the very interesting choice of just like going for the toes um it is just it, it's fun it's entertaining it's it still sets up that sort of sexual dynamic you would really like quentin tarantino i have a feeling <laughs> professor have you heard of quentin tarantino before um uh, i don't think i've actually seen much tarantino uh myself i know of him i know of his work oh you know you know of his reputation with uh his foot fetish right no Oh, yeah, that's the thing. Uh, he okay. features feet prominently in his film. So if you're if you're interested more in, in that aspect, Professor, uh, we, we don't judge. We don't shame here. Uh, check out Tarantino. <laughs> um, <laughs> this is a very revealing podcast. Anyone who goes for this longer podcast will learn all the true dark secrets of Professor here. Um, <laughs> Diane, this is the Professor. It is currently 1243, and the scent of Ulmus Americana, the great American elm from across the street, is the only welcoming thing about today, as my work on this pod has come to a screeching halt. My associate, Khalil, has demanded the pod be cut in half to appease the masses, despite my attesting to a preferred, longer format. But, in the words of the 19th century German philosopher, Friedrich Nietzsche, you have your way, I have my way. As for the right way, the correct way, and the only way, it does not exist. So with that, I have agreed to a compromise. And so the pod will be split on podcast stations, while the video will be made into a glorious two and a half hour special. However, seeing as he humiliated me with false accusations of feed preferences, I would ask you send me a pair of earbuds to finally still his voice from my mind and allow me a moment of peace for once. Three favorite scenes and moments. I think what would work... OK, do you want to say all three or alternate one each that way? I don't know what's easier for us because we're only doing three here. I think that just kind of like as similar to how the uh, listing of characters go. I'll just do my top three and then you do your top three. Like three, Sounds two, one. Sounds good to me. Yeah. 
Uh, so number three for my favorite scenes, I will like to go with uh, Audrey in bed. Audrey in bed and how Cooper wants to help. This is a very hmm. interesting uh, exploration of both characters and where they sort of stand with one another. Uh, I enjoy the fact that Cooper is at least mostly honest with everything that has gone on with um, his emotions towards Audrey, just both validating her, but at the same time telling her that there's an understanding like, no, that we, we cannot go through with any of this. But if you want an ear to listen, uh, by all means, I'll go grab some. Uh, I believe it was like malts and fries um, <laughs> from, yeah. I guess, the hotel may serve that or the double R may deliver or serve late. Um, but just sitting down and just having that chance to sort of talk and even the statement of um, just how revealing secrets are to someone. It's it's very engaging. I honestly could I do not think that they could have handled that moment better, uh, especially with the lead in from the prior episode being like Audrey's literally naked inside of Cooper's bed. So, mm -hmm. no, I think that was a fantastic scene that um, happened. Uh, number and two, I would say good use of cliffhanger too. the way that the episode prior set that up and it had a payoff. Yes, absolutely. It had a great payoff. A lot of times. A lot of times I feel like the uh, like the setup of Cooper having the dream and then the next day forgetting the killer <laughs> is kind of anticlimactic. It's beautiful. This one actually did a good job, I think, following that up. Yes. Uh, number two uh, is going to be Tibet. Uh, viewers of this podcast will know uh, how much uh, I went into the Tibet scene and how just fantastic that experience was, at least for me. Um and I don't think you even realize, even, you know, listeners, how much he actually was. He was not exaggerating when he said he paused the show for like an hour to take. Yeah, notes. It literally. You only heard we only heard in the podcast a fraction of how much you probably had scribbled down. Yeah, I was literally like note for note, just like uh, writing down each uh, detail that I was seeing inside of those um, points what, where we throw the rocks, where we talk about certain things and just had like side by side notes on uh, what was happening in the scene and what was being said. Um so, yeah, I I went crazy word for word with the Tibet moment and the uh, throwing rocks moment that it was just it, it was thrilling. I love whenever a scene can make me do that. Uh, so I'm very thankful that that came through. It was both a very nice communication to the audience on how uh they sort of handle these characters, what to look forward to and what to just kind of keep on to the sidelines. Um it just overall was a very expertly executed scene that had its own sense of Twin Peaks strangeness to it. So, yeah, big kudos to whoever planned any of that out. Um, if somehow all of that was an accident, big Ed kudos. That, <laughs> if that was all just some sort of accident, I would be surprised, to say the least. Mm -hmm. um, my number one scene has to be... Uh, if you are watching this podcast on anything like Spotify or anything like that, you'll notice the two cups of coffee. The cup of coffee scene is my favorite scene in all of Twin Peaks. It's it's rare for me to find a scene that the quote itself is something that I will carry along with myself uh, from day to day. Uh, if to make it more clear, it's a point in which uh, Harry's be. Uh, Harry Truman is being a bit impatient and he's wanting to get along. He's clearly frustrated and there's a couple cups of coffee right in front of them. And Cooper just kind of like lays it down and says, here, I'm going to tell you, a, I'm going to tell you a little secret every day. Once a day, give yourself a present. Don't plan it. Don't wait for it. Just let it happen. That that tells me a lot of Cooper's character. It tells me about the dynamic between him and Truman. And it's just generally a very nice piece of advice. Just kind of like letting yourself uh, be free in a moment that you may have not expected that moment to come, but just enjoy it like a good old cup of coffee. Um, so, yeah, I adore that scene. And I remind myself of that quote whenever like things get a little bit too crazy for myself. And I can appreciate a show doing that for me. I think it's just kind of remarkable, too, that that's your favorite, because when we chose the cup of coffee image, you hadn't seen that. <laughs> <laughs> like when we when we I don't is that correct, though, if I'm remembering, remembering correctly, when we were deciding what image to use, 
you had not yet seen that scene. No, it, it just was a very nice image at at that point. We were just deciding on. So that's purely coincidence. It is coincidence, but it worked so well. I think that that's just a lot of our overall um, careers in anything of. Uh, entertainment value. A lot of accidents happened with our Odina video. A lot of accidents happened with Twin Peaks. Careers. I mean, maybe it will become, maybe maybe this is a podcast career, I guess you could argue, but (laughs) you are right. You are right. We've had some very fun encounters with games and and series and coincidences. Coincidences figure largely in our lives. Um, (laughs) Taking that David Lynch approach. My top three are completely different. Okay. My top three are completely different from yours. I will mention, I did have notable mentions that, uh, yes, I'm cheating here, uh, and and I'm just going to say them. I'm not going to explain. The Tibetan method uh, was one of them, uh, and then Bobby and Jacoby therapy was the other. So you said it was completely different, and you proceed to say, yeah, one of them was Tibetan. Those are my notable mentions. My top, it didn't make it in my top three. So I figured I'd just mention that Uh, the Tibetan method was one that almost got there, and so was the Jacoby therapy session. But my top three... Number three is the Blood Brothers scene between Hank and Josie. Um, Josie's not a character that, uh, uh, in season one at least, uh, has been ever my favorite. Uh, I, I always kind of didn't really know what to think of Josie. I think that's kind of the idea for her character. And I think you've put it pretty nicely uh, in, in a previous podcast, Professor, where you're talking about how Catherine kind of had a sudden change, but Josie's been a slow sliding scale towards suspicion. Josie's character is such a slow burn in the background. And you're always like, OK, you know, what's with her whole broken English thing? You know, is, is this is, again is the question of does this age poorly that they have to have the, the Asian woman not how to speak English properly? But then you start to clue in, OK, a lot of things that Josie does that are just oops, LOL, I made an accident. I'm a foreigner might be actually her plan. <laughs> <laughs> Josie, Josie's a bit manipulative to what extent we don't know fully, but the way she interacts with others it's clearly hinted with her interactions with Ben, but I think it's the most notable with Hank. And that's why I really like the scene, because I think the moment with Hank is the one that most cements Josie's heel turn, if you want to use wrestling terminology. The moment where it's very clear that Josie isn't to be trusted fully is that when Hank cuts his thumb, cuts her thumb, presses together, he sucks his thumb because that's what Hank does. Uh, Josie smears it over her lips. And in that way, she seals the pact as well. Yeah. She is not some innocent, you know, unwilling participant. It's not like Josie's cut, but, you know, stuck between a rock and a hard place. She's only doing this with Hank to get, you know, to save herself from from Catherine. No, let's not kid ourselves here. She is she is in on this. She is actively working with Ben that if Catherine dies, she gets money. Right. (laughs) So the moment where. Josie makes this Blood Brothers pact, I think, is just really significant for both those characters and is an excellent interaction between two characters. We really didn't know their relationship until that. point. And the character choices with that. Uh, I did mention this in the prior, but uh, Hank outright just licks his wounds and just kind of keeps on going. It's almost as if he yeah. just lets it uh, linger there for a moment and just kind of keeps moving forward uh, like this great force. He's determined. Meanwhile, Josie rubs the uh, blood on her lipstick and it matches the color perfectly. It's as if it is just going on to the mask she presents herself with. Yeah. It, uh, great character choices. It's fantastic. It's they both savor the taste in different ways. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's it's interesting. And again, I think it does so much for both these characters. I think both performers are really good in that scene. Uh, I just really like it. Uh, my number two is Bobby Christ Superstar at Laura's funeral. Uh, the I'm going to kind of lump the scenes. If you don't want me to, that's OK. I, w- I would still be fine to view them as separate, but I view his conversation with his father and I view him yelling at the sermon as one thing. But if you won't let me do both together, if that's cheating, then I will say for sure Bobby's speech at Laura's funeral when he lashes out. That I think is so important for Bobby as a character and for the show, because all the stuff that Cooper and other people are talking about, how special Twin Peaks is, how, you know, Twin Peaks is different. There's purity. There's goodness here. You know, Albert, you don't get it, you know. For for Bobby as a character is the only one just willing to just say you're all hypocrites. You're either lying or you're too stupid to see it. You didn't really care about Laura. If you really did, you would have done something about it. And then he includes himself in that, too. I think it's such a moment of clarity for him. And yeah, it's a brash teenager thing to do. It fits Bobby's character. But I think it's one of those moments where Bobby's brash 
yelling, boisterous personality, that rebellious spirit fortifies itself into something actually meaningful. I think it's Bobby telling people something they kind of should hear. <laughs> Man, you, you are just obsessed with this idea of cheating. Uh, no, it just adds more context and insight. So, yeah, by all means, uh, quote unquote, cheat all you want. Again, I think the conversation with the father lumps in. Uh -huh. Yeah, I think the conversation with the father lumps in mainly because it sets up what he's just about to do in front of everyone else. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it makes me wonder what would Major Briggs have thought of that speech? You know, what did he say to Bobby afterward? Mm. Was he proud of his son for speaking his mind? You know, I could see it going both ways. I could see, you know, <laughs> you know, I understand your your hardened feelings of antagonism and questioning the commonly uh, understood societal niceties. You know, is, is he going to like verbosely compliment Bobby uh -huh. or is he going to slam him down? That's not the right thing. I, I think both sides would be fun. I, I like that. I don't know. I, I don't want to know, but I think it's fun to think okay. how would Major Briggs have felt about his son's outburst because his own feelings on Bobby's rebelliousness has always been a little conflicted. Um, and then my number one favorite scene, I was really surprised it wasn't one of your three is the red room dream. I, uh, I was surprised that it wasn't one of yours. But for me, that that quintessential moment of pure David Lynch surrealism, uh, the the visual style, how strikingly different that is from the rest of the show. Um, the I mean, I it's iconic now. Even, you know, it's iconic, even though you've been avoiding spoilers. Oh. The Chevron pattern on the floor, the red curtains have become so synonymous with Twin Peaks. Um, oh, no, I imagine that this is on a lot of people's lists. Um uh, as far as oh, for sure, just, just enjoying that sense of David Lynch surrealism. And yes, it was very entertaining for me. I just simply preferred other scenes over it. If you gave me a top 10 scene list, it likely would still be on there. Um, it just doesn't come close to the top three because those ones are just more personally engaging for me. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Yeah, I think the Red Room does so much to characterize the spiritual, mystical, surreal side of Twin Peaks and it packs so much into that moment that lingers throughout the more normal moments. Um, it does a lot, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, and it was something that struck me my first time watching it. It was probably the moment where I realized I was really interested in Twin Peaks when I first watched the show. Mm -hmm. um, I was probably interested to that point, but that was the moment where it's like, OK, this is something different. This isn't just a normal, weird soap opera. This is a very, <laughs> very weird, normal soap opera. <laughs> um <laughs> So thank you for sharing. I'm glad our lists were different. That was very interesting. Yeah. Um, I have less less trivia for episodes two and three. Uh, episode two, going back to what I mentioned earlier about uh, Catherine Coulson as the actress who would go on to play the log lady. Um, back when David Lynch was shooting Eraserhead, this was when Catherine Coulson was married to Pete Martell, uh, not actual, you know, the actor, uh, Jack Nance. Uh, apparently, Lynch had told Catherine Coulson uh, that he had this idea for a TV series he was going to call, I'll test my log with every branch of knowledge, where he envisioned <laughs> Catherine Coulson playing a girl who would carry a log with her. And he specifically wanted to be a Ponderosa Pine because that was the kind that Lynch's father had done his thesis oh. on. His father had written a thesis about trees. And the log girl would then interview experts in different fields about their work and about the wood of the log. OK. And then 15 years later, you know, that actually happened with the log lady, basically. Mm -hmm. um, so 15 years before Twin Peaks, he already had this idea of a series called I'll Test My Log with Every Branch of Knowledge. <laughs> so how many of those things were just deep seated in him for years? You uh -huh. know, for uh, episode three, uh, the original funeral scene actually had very little of a script. Um, there's a few details that you'll notice, especially upon rewatching things that the actors had decided, uh, or maybe people, had, you know, worked on the set decided that weren't even in the script. So a couple really good Not examples. Again, Leland. I, I don't see, I don't know. I don't actually know what was in the script. That actually might've been <laughs> improv. Um, actually, I actually will get to that in a moment. I, I really look down at my notes. I will get to that. Uh, but two before that, though, um, there's a, a happy face, a happy smiley face pin that Betty Briggs is wearing like a happy, you know, just an innocent happy face on Betty Briggs's clothes. Uh, and then Johnny's holding a, a copy of the book, Peter Pan, which you can read so much into that. But Johnny's possession of Peter Pan was a decision by the actor. I just think that's brilliant. Mm -hmm. Um, and then, yeah, I put on here that supposedly, again, I don't claim these as fact. 
just what I've read. Even the part where Leland throws himself onto the casket is supposedly the actor's idea. Supposedly, the actor who plays <laughs> Leland, Ray Wise, that was his idea that in the father's enormous grief, he would throw himself upon the casket. So when you mentioned that uh, Sarah's response of, uh, you know, why do you have to ruin this, too? That might have been improv because the whole thing, it sounds like, wasn't originally planned. That is fantastic. Honestly, um, I can I'm, I'm a little concerned with that, too, just because that's also just trusting the police system can handle two bodies. Uh, well, obviously, likely will it be empty. Yeah. Well, I mean, I imagine it wasn't fully improv. It's probably like they were about to shoot. And then Ray Wise is like, I got an idea, guys. What if I lunge onto the. The coffin. And then they probably did some weight testing or whatever and then decided to do that and kind of on the spot, yeah. you know, came up with the idea of that. OK, that's kind of what I imagine I mean, had happened here. Who knows? Just because there was also the moment later on in the series that we spoke about where he uh, he, he had a cut hand. Um, did he get a cut hand beforehand and saying like, hey, guys, listen, my hand's cut. How about we go about this? No, I am. I, I think I, I don't know if that's in my notes or not, but I am very certain, pretty confident that that scene the, the cut was real and that that was not planned. That was something Ray Wise had done in the moment. Again, if yeah. we're led to believe these rumors, Ray Wise is a genius. Like, like in the moment to do those things. Yeah, with Ray Wise, that's what I, I'm thinking. Like, I don't know if there may have even been a test around with that. If, uh, if we're thinking of a case similar to his hand getting cut. Um, mm -hmm. I, I do not know how far his uh, acting will go. Ray Wise, you beautiful, beautiful madman. <laughs> um, last thing on episode three. This was really weird. Uh, there was supposedly going to be a scene in the original draft of episode three script where Cooper was going to visit a graveyard. He was going to meet an elderly groundskeeper. So we, we get the scene where he goes to the, the cemetery and sees Jacoby. So I assume it'd be around that time, right? But apparently, <laughs> you know, Jacoby with his part time job of being a gravekeeper. Well, no, apparently the elderly <laughs> groundskeeper would recite a long speech telling Cooper that if he puts his ear to the ground, he can hear those who are buried singing due to the coffins expanding. And then apparently the scene was cut due to problems casting the groundskeeper. Now, <laughs> If that's to be believed, that will, I actually wish that scene was in there. That sounds great. <laughs> like just and Cooper are like <laughs> having to like roll with that, you know, like, can he hear them singing or not? <laughs> I don't know. I really like the uh, Jacoby scene and I don't think that they would play him back and forth. Yeah, I don't I don't think get rid of Jacoby and I don't think Jacoby is the right character to say the whole singing thing. But I think maybe on the way to Jacoby, he runs into the elderly gravekeeper, you know, who can then tell him the thing about listening to the ground and then <laughs> Cooper's just like, uh, thanks. And then just walks on. <laughs> you know, um, I disagree with that just because I think that it is more uh, like impactful that Jacoby is here completely alone. Like there's no groundskeeper in sight. He wanted to be out of eyeshot, earshot of everyone, it would seem, and just pay his respects. Mm -hmm. Um, so, yeah, I, I think okay. that the absence of it is fine. I like the quote and um, I'm probably going to be thinking on this a little bit more later, uh, but I'm more thankful that I got cut than it being kept in. Fair enough. So we're now at the part where we're going to rank episodes of season one now. OK, I would like okay. to Ooh, request boy. that we Ooh, boy. I would request that we keep our commentary minimal such that. Gotcha. I will keep mine completely minimal. I'm scared. Go ahead, Professor. <laughs> OK, here we go. So uh, top uh, eight episodes. OK, so starting with eighth place, eighth place, the pilot, seventh place, the first episode, sixth place, the second episode, fifth place, the third episode, fourth place, the fourth episode, third place, the fifth episode, second place, the sixth episode and number one, the seventh episode. That's very interesting. Can I ask you just specifically? <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Minimal. Commentary. No, that was excellent. That's perfect. <laughs> can I just can I just ask why is the pilot, in your opinion, the the weakest ranking episode of season it's, one? 
It's less of a question on what is weaker and the main appeal for uh, Twin Peaks. Twin Peaks is an overarching essence of a larger mystery. And one thing that Twin Peaks does very well is that it gives you various uh, sh strands of yarn to continue pulling and yanking at. Uh, what the Twin Peaks has done very well is that uh, anything that it's given as far as information goes has not seemed not so fulfilling. Like, there's been poor execution with uh, James and Donna with the overall lines of Laura, but I'm still entertained and intrigued on uh, what more we'll get out of Laura, what more we'll be getting out of the lumber mill. Uh, Twin Peaks has very well continued to get my attention and interest more and more with each episode. Could this just be my overall feeling with just a first time viewing and a second time viewing it might change? Perhaps. But overall, I think that it is uh, a measure of a good mystery story to say that the story just keeps getting more intriguing, better, uh, and continues to grow with me. So yes, I'm very happy with my experience watching season one of Twin Peaks. OK, well, we'll get more of your overall thoughts on season one in a bit. Um, yes. Yeah. A very interesting list. Um, could you <laughs> let me run through mine? And then I think will be very helpful for listeners is after I run through mine, you can ask any questions you want. OK, then I say we just quickly say ours again, just so listeners can kind of hear the differences. OK, so my eighth place is episode four, the one armed man. Seventh place, episode one, traces to nowhere. Six is episode five, Cooper's dreams. Fifth is the pilot, so right around the middle. Fourth is episode three, Rest in Pain. Number three is episode six, Realization Time. My second favorite episode is episode seven, The Last Evening. And my favorite episode of season one is episode two, Zen or the Skill to Catch a Killer. OK, OK. Uh, I, I, I just love the fact that for me and, I, and considering I explained my favorite scene. Yeah, yeah. I, I, the fact that you chose your favorite to be the Tibet uh, episode is very favorable for my end. The, but the dream the sequence, dream sequence, the, sure. The but dream more importantly, sequence. the Tibet yeah. sequence. Yes, yes. <laughs> and even more importantly, the baguettes. Oh. That was the scene with it had the probably the best opening in season one, that like 10 minute shot of them eating those eating dinner and then it gets, gets interrupted by the sandwiches. Now, so I good. may be mistaken, uh, but this was the first episode we saw with like David Lynch's uh, moniker as like lead director um, for the episode. No, no, oh, the pilot was okay. the pilot. Uh, the pilot is written and directed by him. And then episode okay, two, he's directing. Well. Uh, yeah, no, <laughs> it's. Definitely a good opener for Lynch, and this is uh, an episode that definitely feels like Lynch. So, um, yeah, I, I can definitely um, see you having this appeal towards it. So that's very cool. So just for listeners, I think it'd be very helpful. Uh, actually, hmm, how, how about we do this? Uh, we'll go through and just kind of remind where it was on our list. So the pilot for mine was fifth on my list. And on yours, it was eighth. The this is where you say yeah, eighth. eighth. Yeah, yes. Yeah, but again, okay. everything's going in order. <laughs> right. And then episode one was seventh. For me, it was what for you? Seventh. Uh, well, that that would be number one. No. OK, you're going to you're going to cut this when we when we do the post editing, you're going to cut this. OK, because I think you're misunderstanding yeah. what I'm saying. I'm saying let's go through the order of the series and just re remind where it was in our on our ranking, just in, in that order. So like pilot one, two, three, up to up to the ending with seven. So let's let's just we'll cut that when we do post, please. Um, Hello, Diane. This is Professor from the future. Uh, I am calling in to tell you do not cut this. In fact, keep it in not only for pride reasons, but because Khalil can't tell me what to do. So what I think would be helpful for uh, audiences maybe is that we just go through the series in order and say what number that was for us in case that helps contextualize it since it's a lot to take in at once. So we have the pilot first. I put the pilot as fifth. Would you put it as? Mine is a very easy list to follow. Um, I put it at number eight. Eight. Uh, episode one, I put seventh. You put... At, at seventh as well. OK, uh, episode two, I put as my first, my favorite. You put it as uh, audience. We are learning a lesson counting backwards. This is number six. So are all yours in order? Yes. 
Uh, like oh. I told you, each one progressing, uh, like the series just kept on uh, intriguing me more and more. So the pilot is my last and the uh, final episode was my first number one. So it progressively drew me in more and intrigued me more. So I probably sound really silly not realizing that. But I say I say we keep <laughs> this in, in the podcast professor because if i didn't pick up on that that is at least one person who might not have <laughs> there's so many like things being conveyed when you said your list i didn't even realize that was eight seven six five <laughs> <laughs> so let's you know it makes me look a little slow uh, a little dumb that's okay i say keep it in i say okay. i say that's interesting to me though so much though because because mine jumps four one five yeah, it does. pilot three six seven two Huh. And like I said before, uh, it might just be my interpretation. Like you are going in on a second viewing and uh, are taking in uh, more information from it. Meanwhile, this is my first time viewing. This is my first time dealing with the mystery of Twin Peaks, which I don't know anything really about. Sure. So uh, working in, I'm just more so drawn into the mystery each episode, which is uh, a compliment to the genre and how they're handling it. That's so, fascinating to me, because even the episodes that had your favorite scenes then didn't necessarily rank because mm -hmm. like you loved the tibet scene but that didn't Absolutely. mean that that episode was any higher than sixth place that's interesting no uh, no it, overall the more i see of twin peaks the more intrigued i am and the huh. better the big bits of dopamine rush i get from each subsequent episode i don't know if it's going to be the same way for season two <laughs> i like the idea okay we do we, we should rank all of our episodes in season two just for the idea of you having to like <laughs> do this list and it's literally just and the last episode was the best <laughs> like it's all working it's like completely, <laughs> just counting completely in order again <laughs> completely in order in all 22 of them or however many there you are know, i can all i can only hope that uh as i keep going through twin peaks i feel like it keeps getting better so yeah, um, of course that would be the goal <laughs> yes that would be very funny though and i would probably fight you on that because i would disagree with that opinion hardcore but i won't say why um episode for trivia, uh, I got a little bit on this one. Um, in the original script of this episode, there was going to be a scene where it would be James talking to his mother, Colleen Marshall. Um, and I think this is around the point where James has that weird conversation with Donna, where he's like, Donna, I lied. My parents were really this, this and this. But there was supposed to be a scene where the mother would actually be there. But then it didn't make it into the episode. And it was supposed to be in the script again in episode 10 of season two. And then didn't happen. So you hmm. never see the mom. That is kind of a spoiler. At the same time, I think it's something that at this point, it's fine. Were you really holding out to see James's mom? Um, I just no. I just think it's really interesting that this thing had almost happened in episode four. And then, you know, in episode 10 of season two was going to get brought back again and still didn't happen and then just got dropped. That's sad. That's sad. I mean, I don't know if it's sad because I don't know if I care about James's mom. Um, well, I actually I really had some don't. hopes that we would be able to expand more on James and his living situation. So I guess I'll just take that off of my hopes for season two. So I'll just go no, ahead. And I, the I, delete no, key. you can go ahead and you yeah, can snap, still snap, say snap, that. Snap. <laughs> no, it's ruined now. This is your fault. I mean, I'm not saying that you won't get expanded information. I'm just saying you're not going to physically see the mom there. That doesn't mean you're not going to learn more. Um. But you, again, you've already told you me that Santa Lynch doesn't exist. So unfortunately, uh, I know I have to live with this. Yes, Santa Lynch. OK, uh, another another thing was interesting is that the actor who plays Hank Jennings, uh, the actor Chris Mulkey, uh, he was describing uh, working with uh, with Lynch as kind of being guided in his character a little bit. Um, and here is what he said. My first scene is the phone call from prison. And Lynch said, hey, Chris, take this domino here. Just Hank has a domino. So I said, OK, sure. I was waiting around to shoot, so I stuck it in my mouth. He goes, yeah, that's it. Roll. And he says, I can't tell you about the domino. Though. <laughs> I can't tell you about the domino, though. There. Are, oh, no, no, I, I didn't do my quotation marks right. OK, so, yeah, that's it. Roll is Lynch. And then <laughs> Chris Mulkey says to the person interviewing him, I can't tell you about the domino, though. There are two or three things I'm not supposed to talk about. And the double four is one of them. It adds up to eight, which has something to do with balance in the universe. You'll figure it out. Which is real weird because the domino we saw, I'm pretty sure was three and three in that scene. But OK, I could be remembering it wrong. But I remember us talking about it being three and three. But uh, 
Yeah, I would have to double check that as well as just check dominoes in general. No, yeah, they would be double. If it was double fours, that would be squares. That would be two sets of squares. But instead, it was three. So, it hmm. was three and three, which is makes me wondering if 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 uh, if Chris Mulkey here is making it up or if he's remembering it wrong or I don't know. It's curious. Um, small thing. Oh. I, I would probably go with maybe the uh, latter, like three and four are an easy number to mix up, especially if they've never had the reveal given to them. Right. Um, small thing, Madeline Ferguson, Maddie Ferguson, the cousin, or actually Laura, depending on how to believe it. She's said to be from Missoula, Montana, yeah. which is actually the hometown of uh, series creator David Lynch. David Lynch is from Missoula, Montana. Really? Yep. Exciting. Uh, really interesting one that I think, yeah, definitely should mention here is that the one armed man in Twin Peaks is commonly understood to be a reference to the uh, spoilers for the movie The Fugitive, uh, the real killer in the movie The Fugitive. And his name, Philip Gerard, that's the name given to the man who's the one-armed man, is in reference to the police officer pursuing the one-armed man in The Fugitive. Make of that what you will, Professor. That's not saying any spoilers. I'm just letting you know that's, hmm. you know, what it's a reference to. Anyone who's seen The Fugitive, when they're told there's a one-armed man and there's Philip Gerard, that's really weird. Because simultaneously that character is the killer, but also named after the person who's pursuing the killer. And what do you make of that? I don't know, but it's it's out there in the open. Um, I don't know. Just context, because I had never seen The Fugitive, so I didn't know that. Um, <laughs> episode five, Waldo the Bird is voiced by Cheryl Lee, the actress who plays Laura and Maddie. Which, I mean, makes sense because it's, you know, Waldo repeating, <laughs> you know, Laura's words. But it is actually Laura doing the voice. I just thought that was kind of funny. I don't know if the bird noises in general I'll probably heard them too. I don't know. Um, more name stuff. Waldo and uh, the man who runs the uh, I think it was a pet hospital or whatever this was. Bob Lidecker, right? Uh, that's the one that one our man tells him to go check into is Bob Lidecker. Both Waldo and Bob Lidecker are references to the film noir film called Laura. Huh. One character, Wal Waldo Lidecker, is obsessed with a woman named Laura who fakes her own death. Oh, you don't say. No. Again, I'm not telling you what to do with it, Professor. I'm just telling you it's out no, there. No, no parallelisms that I'm thinking of. No. Well, okay. None whatsoever. Read into it as you wish. And then uh, the name of the insurance salesman who visits Catherine Martell, his name is Walter Neff. This is a reference to the 1944 film Double Indemnity, which is about an insurance fraud plot also involving an insurance salesman named Walter Neff. I was really hoping that somehow you would just tell me it was going to be called the double R just so that I could have that other uh, conspiracy in my head on uh, the meals for wheels being a secret front. No. <laughs> <laughs> um, it isn't so much to ask to say that everything innocent can't just be horrible in this universe. All right. Is that too much to ask? I'll let you call out to the void. I'm not going to respond to your question. Um... <laughs> this is where I had marked for us to talk about our first impressions of season one. Um, strengths, weaknesses, how does it compare to other TV at the time or to TV now? Um, we can kind of abbreviate this a bit because I think we've done so much talking about it just in earlier questions. But this is really for your opinion, yeah. Professor. I'm going to stay out of this. As a first time viewer, how does Twin Peaks hold up? Twin Peaks holds up extremely well. Um, I was saying earlier uh, that um, the genre of mystery um, is something that is interesting to try to hold up. And this has been very appealing for me so far. Uh, I can see people rewatching the prior episodes to see if they've missed any key details, uh, looking through the cinematography like we were mentioning with Amir or the characters moments. Uh, that uh, you can get real a lot more satisfaction from on additional viewings and until you yourself or my me myself are satisfied. Um, so, yeah, I can see why uh, Twin Peaks can be listed as an inspiration for someone's works or uh, one of their favorite series just because it has shown to be a very appealing mystery. OK, thank you very much. Um, moving on, then. Last two episodes of trivia. Episode six. 
Uh, this is a quote from Mark Frost. It doesn't necessarily be episode six trivia. I just think it fit, uh, fit really well here. Um, Mark Frost said, we've always thought Cooper was a weird amalgam 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 that's the word amalgam of david kyle and myself and that's how i remember the process kyle of course being kyle mclaughlin david being david lynch i wrote a lot of the cooper monologues after the ones david and i had done together of any character i'd worked on to that point i was writing cooper in something close to my own voice his curiosity his analytical nature and underlying interest in mythology and spirituality so mark frost speaking about how he views Cooper as a combination of himself, David Lynch, and the actor Kyle MacLachlan. Um, there was a del- this one is a really I put this one in here to bring it up, but I have been hitting a wall with this. So I remember thinking it was a different episode, but then when I looked into it again, like double checking my research, I found something other than that. So somewhere, supposedly there was going to be a deleted scene where it was going to talk about Audrey remembering a time when she had pushed her brother Johnny down a staircase, possibly causing his condition. Okay. Right? Hmm. Um, This scene didn't end up happening. Now, where I thought it was supposed to be when I read this, when I did the initial research, is there's a moment where Audrey is, like, laughing, and then she, like, there's a cut to, like, I think it's Leland dancing, and then she's crying. And it seemed like a really sudden transition. Yeah. I thought that was where the scene was supposed to be. But then when I did my research later, it popped up as a different episode. It was being talked about. So I don't know. Okay. I put it under episode six because I think that's where I was seeing it later. Just the idea that there might have been a scene cut with Audrey being the potential cause of at least some of Johnny's um, problems that he's had. Um, make of that what you will. Uh, episode seven. Yeah, it's compelling. Episode seven. Uh, this is the only episode that Mark Frost directs in the entire series. But Mm -hmm. he also directs all of the Invitation to Love episodes, uh, which was they were all shot in one day with only one or two takes done for each of the 20 scenes that were done. uh, No, it definitely it definitely makes sense, not only for the ham acting, but just for overall production, Uh, just like not even having to uh, really deal too much with changing up sets. Um, I've seen uh, behind the scenes where it's not too uncommon where all of a set of scenes, especially in short um, succession, are just done in just one long use of takes. David Lynch and Mark Frost had essentially final cut over Twin Peaks, which sometimes upset ABC executives. For example, in my research, I found that they were not too happy about the scene with Philip Gerard, an amputee, half naked in a bath towel. They thought it might offend families. Mm-hmm. But Lynch had to push his final cut authority to make sure that that happened. <laughs> uh, you know, that you can you can see the man in a bath towel with one arm. Uh, I mean, and then the last thing. Oh, go on. I mean, we deal with like Benjamin Horn sucking toes, so I don't see how the <laughs> that's the family that entertainment. It develops a healthy attitude towards sex. the fact that a one armed man will bathe and how we have to recognize that people with one arms bathe. I don't see why that would upset families more unless that was yeah. also an argue. Who's yeah, point. 90s TV censorship is weird or this is just not a true thing that happened. I don't know. Censorship in general is weird. Uh, yeah. I know that, um, like, trying to argue with things like Disney, uh, one person who was inspired by uh, Twin Peaks, uh, Alex Hirsch, uh, he made Gravity Falls, and there was literally this point uh, in which, like, during the point of just arguing with censors, like, saying, like, uh, spin the bottle, uh, kissing might happen, and they say, no, we can't, like, you you can't just do this, this spin the bottle reference. Uh, what will people uh, think will happen? They'll kiss? Uh, so instead, uh, he just went back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, and the series of just horrifying things happening, happening, and spin the bottle was their big concern. So he's like, okay, uh, how about this? Uh, like, this is not CMP approved, which is uh s&p approved which was the, the people who were in charge of censoring it's like that, no one will really get it yeah but can you approve it uh uh not approved by uh, s&p has been approved by s&p uh so yeah like censorship nowadays is still plenty weird as compared to uh censorship beforehand 
on that note, you're you're a big fan of uh, Gravity Falls, Professor. I know that before. Um, yes. Oh, I love mystery in general. So, yeah, the, both have been treats, Gravity Falls and Twin Peaks. I was going to say, I haven't dived into Gravity Falls, but it, it seemed upon initial impact to be pretty inspired by Twin Peaks, just given what it is. Um, Literally, there was uh, the curtained room, and I believe that there was the Chevron patterns on the floor sure. for one of the um, areas inside of Twin Peaks that we got to visit for just for a little bit. But yeah, it seems that I, uh, he enjoyed Twin Peaks plenty. Cool. Uh, my last piece of trivia on here is that the producers of Twin Peaks sent ABC false scripts for the season one finale. And by the oh. time that they had been doing this, no episode of Twin Peaks had aired before the season finale was shot. Mm -hmm. Even the pilot hadn't aired yet. So people didn't know the reaction to the show until, you know, already this had happened. So they yeah. were shooting the season finale before the pilot had even been out. And the false scripts had been released to kind of placate, you know, because <laughs> obviously some of the choices made in the season one finale are pretty bold and assume assume a continuation. <laughs> No, the, that that is very intriguing. Like that is definitely a risk uh, to even take just because, yeah, these people are going to be putting forward the content. Uh, I know that there have been more uh, spiteful outcomes from tricks like this. Um, right. Uh, a lot I could say, but I won't get into um, just I'll let it linger in the background. You know, there are. There are many discussions that have happened about behind the scenes with Twin Peaks, the network, Lynch, everyone involved. This is just one area of conflict and concern and whether or not that percolated. I mean, obviously, they found out the scripts were fake when the actual thing happened. Right. So I assume that created some <laughs> bad blood, potentially. How much you think that matters? It definitely percolated. <laughs> it definitely percolated with a nice fishy flavor. Did I did I say percolated? You said percolated. I find myself saying percolated a lot because of this show because I don't actually <laughs> drink coffee. So I don't think about percolators outside this show. For all I know, percolators are an invention of this show. Like <laughs> like how Legend of Zelda has the Triforce. This has percolators because I don't think of them outside of it. No, I'm um, pretty sure that that concludes the percolators came before the Twin Peaks. Fair. I don't know that, though. <laughs> um, that concludes all the trivia that I found. Again, I used IMDb, Twin Peaks Wiki. And I want to put a plug in here for Brad Duke's Reflections and Oral History of Twin Peaks. Uh, that was where I got most of the interview information. Uh, really, really good book. If, you ha if you're a Twin Peaks fan and haven't checked it out, obviously it has spoilers for later on in the series, so don't read it until you finish the series. Mm -hmm. But it's a great resource. I really like it. Okay. All right, so the last thing I have on here, as we wrap up our very short, <laughs> very short podcast, as I see it <laughs> etched toward the two-hour mark here, uh, again... If you've been listening, thank you. Thank you. Uh, also, I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> I'm not. Let's just talk about oh, season two hopes and predictions. I don't if it's OK with you, I would like to start because mine don't matter as much as yours. <laughs> um, I solemnly blood oath swear that mine are not spoilers. Uh -huh. I am putting myself in the perspective of you right now. This does not mean any of the things I ask for happen or don't happen. Proceed. Speak for me, Khalil. This is just what I would want in season two. So this is what I would want. I would want an answer to who shot Dale Cooper. I, I feel like it'd be really weird if we didn't get an answer to that. I would be wanting to know who attacked Jacoby. And I would want to know who killed Laura Palmer. So those three acts of violence, especially. I would like some sort of payoff or consequence over Ben's Ghostwood victory. He spent all this time in season one getting Ghostwood. What's he going to do with it? I'd like to see something with that. Uh, I would like to see more supernatural stuff. You know, Bob, Mike, the weird stuff that's going on. Because, again, I mentioned season two. So season one, episode two is my favorite episode of the season. My favorite scene was the dream scene. I would be wanting to see more of that weird, surreal dream stuff happening. Uh, the Darkness in the Woods, right? And along with that, the Bookhouse Boys. I'd like to see more of the Bookhouse Boys. And the last thing, and my list of demands that I am Martin Luther style nailing on the Church of David Lynch, is I'd like to see more Hank Jennings. I think Hank Jennings has been set up as a really interesting character. He we, he might even be like kind of a foil to Cooper in some ways. He 
is that we've talked about it being a mix of Benjamin Horn and Leo Johnson almost, right? He's got such an interesting scene with Josie. Everything's set up with him. I would like to see Hank Jennings become important and interesting in the series. So those are the things that if I were in your shoes, I would want to see. Well, uh, seeing you are like standing in my shoes personally, how dare you? Because two things. Uh, number one, when it comes down to it, Laura Palmer. I have small shoe size. Okay, I'm sorry. Because number one, Laura Palmer is not dead. I refuse to believe this. Laura, <laughs> cousin Maddie, and Laura Palmer. <laughs> Switch places. Okay, I'm in your shoes, but I'm not deluded like you, okay? <laughs> <laughs> I refuse to believe that I'm deluded. I will die on this hill. Uh, secondly, as far as Ben goes, I'm almost confident there's only one of two things that are going to happen. For one, he's going to see his daughter sitting inside that chair and be and understand the position he's in because... What is he going to do next? This is someone who knows about his special little business off on the side and has been following along on this interesting trail that could potentially hurt him a lot. And Audrey isn't exactly someone known for being subtle and not afraid to hurt Horn's business, as we've seen uh, with the Norwegians. It's, so there's only one of two different situations that's going to be coming up. One in which Ben's going to have to calculate how to deal with his daughter and potentially be hurt by that and slip up there. Or two, he's going to just like get called away before like he gets to Audrey, uh, like so someone rings in on the phone or someone's at the door and says, no, we need you quick here, sir, because Cooper or uh, <laughs> uh, our uh, good old buddy, uh, our princely, his princely uh, associate causes a little trouble inside the casino. And then he just quotes Shakespeare and goes off to deal with that. Um, yeah, it's, it's definitely fascinating on what will happen, but I don't think that Ben's going to be standing on his high horse for too long. As far as uh, any further predictions go, uh, going off from your last one with Hank, Hank is the domino man. So my hope is that season one was just a series of dominoes being placed just for them to crash down in a masterful plan sort of way, a domino effect, if you will, for season two in which like I've made the complaint earlier, uh, Hank seems like a character that um, if I were to remove him from Twin Peaks, not much would have changed. I still love moments with him. I still love uh, some instances that uh, he has come up and affected others with. However, in the vast majority of season one, uh, his presence was just that, like setting up certain dominoes whether or not we will see them crashing down in hank's favor or not uh is to be seen i do hope that it goes in hank's favor just because i think that it'll make only more enticing plots from there on um as far as cooper i believe that cooper uh not only from the intro that we have from video to vi video in which he says oh we're going to someplace wonderful and strange doo doo yeah i haven't seen that line yet so i'm just pretty certain that he is alive uh but the way that i think he's going to be brought up uh is going to be uh glossed over like with uh the dream sequence uh where he's just like <laughs> oh yeah um uh, he's like but cooper uh we saw you got shot and he just like sits up from the gun wound. it's like yeah i know but that's not important at this point. I have an idea. Bullets only hurt you if you believe in bullets. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, I have learned a secret Tibetan method. <laughs> or it might just be glossed over like the log lady style, which is like, uh, yes. Oh, this person's this. This person's that. Oh, Cooper, he's been shot. And then we go over here. So, yeah, I I think that we're going to still have Coop uh, uh, continuing forward, and I don't think that we're going to deal that heavily with him being shot. Maybe we might see more of that, and maybe we might see the force against him, but I feel that it's going to be much in the vein of Cooper's dream. Um, Since we titled the section Hopes and Dream, Hopes and Predictions, excuse me, Hopes and Predictions, uh, is that what you hope will happen, or is that more what you think will happen? Well, column A, little column B. Uh, I, okay. I think it would be a fun. I'm assuming you don't want him dead. <laughs> <laughs> he's, 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 you know what? If they commit to the death and still kind of somehow bring him in. Overall, I'll be intrigued on the presentation, to say the least. 
Well, Laura has supposedly been dead since the first moment of the pilot, and it's not like that actress hasn't found a way to reappear. <laughs> Khalil, the problem is, is that she is not dead, and I refuse okay. to believe this. You don't have to whisper to me to tell me that, you know, if you if you truly believe it, Professor, be bold with it. This is the truth. I am being bold, but in the darkness of Twin Peaks. Speaking of darkness, I have not uh, turned a light on. I, I sat down to record this podcast with you at like eight and it was still light outside. So the light was coming through the window. I am now sitting in immersed darkness. <laughs> <laughs> Me too. Me too, actually. So this is the perfect because now we can talk about the darkness in Twin Peaks. Yes. Uh, I believe that the darkness of the woods will become more and more literal, confusing. But I don't think that it'll be answered in the end. I think that they're going to give us plenty to uh, play off of uh, for the more supernatural elements. But I don't think that we'll ever get something very cohesive, uh, like something that we can type down and have a comprehensive guide to the cryptid known as Twin Peaks. Uh, I think Laura Palmer is also going to start popping up literally, and she will begin using people from within this said darkness, uh, whether or not uh, she works alongside of it or if uh, there's just her just operating uh, on the sidelines. I do believe we're going to see more of Laura Palmer, not only from the scene earlier where we see Laura Palmer at double R uh, because that Bob, uh, but also because I don't believe she's dead. So she could become a player later. I think Excellent. that uh, I think uh, we'll discover more about the broken hearts of Laura, the literal and emotional. So I think mm -hmm. that um, we'll be able to uh deal with that more uh because again the jean jacket still bothers me like this pan that picks up the other half of the broken necklace i see no connection with dr jacoby unless we're going to learn something very interesting of jacoby later um i believe that we'll <laughs> delve deeper into mother horn and how she remains connected to Ben, uh, like something I've said earlier, uh, I wanted to see more Ben as well as Mother Horn. I can't remember her name, so we're just going to call her Sylvia. Mother Horn. Mother Horn. Um, <laughs> Sylvia. So, yeah, uh, I'm Sylvia. hoping that Mother <laughs> Horn uh, will prove to be uh, a character to help us become more enlightened on the family situation that Audrey and uh, Ben are faced with. Um, Hawk, he's either going to die a hero or lo live long enough to become a villain. Um, <laughs> not only is he just a fun character that has shown a lot of positive elements. Correct me if I'm wrong, but when they break in to find the one armed man, that was just three people that was uh cooper that was uh, andy and that was truman i don't believe that hawk was there right i don't recall i'll have to look back onto that because if hawk was there i would be surprised if he was not pressing the one-armed man because again he was distracted enough from ronette's uh, family to like even not bring that up would be surprising um so uh, there's that angle to sort of consider. And like I like you said before, he was even just kind of moving off uh, towards the direction of this one armed man, even while interrogating. Sure, it's probably not good that uh, someone is going about the hospital, but I imagine that hospital has some form of security he could even report to for that. So I don't know. There's some things that I'm thinking about with Hawk that make me intrigued. And I don't know if I am. I don't know whether or not my biases will get in the way of potentially. Interesting reveals uh, coming season two. Uh, who knows? Pac might just be literally the uh, second coming of Jesus right here in which. Oh, yes, he is so cool. He's so great. Ooh, do, 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 do. Um, that exactly that. Yeah. Um, are there any other hopes or predictions? Any other, I guess really the hopes is the main one. I'm curious. Is there anything else that? Yes. 
Yes, I'm still going. Oh, oh don't let me stop you. Yeah, uh, we have at least I, I have a prediction that we'll have at least three flashback episodes to learn more of the past uh, within Twin Peaks, primarily Ed, Norma and Nadine, but also moments with Laura. So I'm really hoping for those flashback episodes Thought I might get some in season one, have yet to see any. So I'm really hoping for season two uh, just to explore the younger lives of these uh, people in Twin Peaks. Uh, You're referring to them as uh, like pre kindergarten, like they're pre- in uh, like they're they're like five year old versions. We That's already discussed. For, right? We already discussed like a Muppets Babies version of this. So, yes, uh, like they're inside of a daycare uh, in which we have all the characters of Twin Peaks. I didn't I didn't mention this to you yet, but one of our listeners uh, actually uh, tweeted at us and mentioned that uh, Muppet Babies was, in fact, a real show and uh, had to remind me of that (laughs) scarring idea, which provoked me to (laughs) Google it. And I hope that you, Unplugged Professor and listener, are satisfied because I did look at the Muppets babies and it looked like an atrocity. You're welcome. I am glad to add to your knowledge. You cannot put your hand in a digital puppet. It has legs. It's not even a puppet anymore. <laughs> it takes away what they are. It's a perversion. It's, no, it's an illusion. Like the puppets are supposed to be an illusion of something that is much larger than themselves. I mean, in the end, Big Bird is a puppet with legs. So you cannot even say that puppets can't be without legs. No, Big Bird is not a puppet. He's a costume. There's a difference. He he, he is. His mouth is moved by hands like that of a puppet. But it is a it's a transport puppet. You can move this puppet around with legs. It is possible, Khalil. Like, do you think that they just shove their mouth inside the top end of the costume and go mop, 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 mop to make the words? No, people don't have beaks, Khalil. It's 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 a great job opportunity for people who have very bizarre shaped mouths and very long necks. It's OK to you be know, wrong. People like that have a difficulty finding jobs. And I think the big bird industry has done a great job providing an, an economic utility for those people. And you're over here shaming them. Shaming them for their bodies. Yes. Just because they happen to fit very nicely inside of a Big Bird costume. That doesn't mean they're not people. (laughs) Uh, But lastly, my biggest (laughs) hope. Anyway. (laughs) Anyway, my biggest hope of all has to be uh, I want a continuation on this strange game of Hangman we have going. We currently have two letters in the strange version of Hangman in which one of the letters was taken from Laura Palmer's nail. So we have an R and a T. I am personally hoping that uh, we will see some more deaths in Twin Peaks as we continue to get more letters. Oh, you make fun of me all the time for liking Leo and liking bad people. And you're over here eagerly wanting bloodshed. Absolutely. I want all the bloodshed. Give it to me. Who would you prefer uh, dies? You had to get your letters. Well, well, to finish my thought on that, uh, just because uh, Cooper says that he saw the instance before, uh, I'm hoping for this morbid version of Hangman as we keep getting more letters and we're able to interpret what R&T can lead to. Just because there's all sorts of letters that can go there. I think that the most promising thing with the letters R&T are based off of the Tibet episode, where on the uh, green board, there's a distance between the R and the T. I feel that there is a purpose to that, almost like hinting like there should be things in between the gaps and maybe even stuff before and after but that there are more than one set more than one letter in between the r and t uh so yes i'm hoping to see more of that so that we can continue to solve this puzzle and i really hope that this plot line is not dropped because this is absolutely intriguing uh i'm less confident now that the um Oh, what is her name? She is uh, working with Hank. Josie? Yes, thank you. I am less convinced Josie Packard is going to be killed off anytime soon, especially with that little uh, smear on the lips, unless we're going to have a further driving force uh, with Truman, who will believe in uh, Josie. And oh, you could do so much with that. Recompense. I won't I won't say too much, but we already know a little bit about Hank's relationship with Truman based on the one encounter they've had. 
Uh, there was already like that yes. was that's what uh, spawned Truman's whole uh, you think people can change kind of thing. So, yes, absolutely. I see where you're coming from with that. Mm -hmm. um, as I'm can't decide between uh, Lucy or Andy, but I do believe that uh, one of them may have For which a one moment. dies. Yeah, which one dies? <laughs> I'm leaning more to Andy. <laughs> yeah, you want to hear who I think will die? I mean. The way he reacted about being a parent, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> you wonder with me who will like who I think will die. I'm giving you the options right here. Uh, the big thing is, is that Andy had his overall hero moment, but it kind of was hint hurt by his overall reaction uh, with the whole entire pregnancy. I feel that perhaps Andy will have another sort of chance to be a hero, but more in a sacrificial sense. And he'll have one final moment with um, Lucy uh, to kind of reconcile uh, or something will be left behind f uh, by Lucy for Andy to reconcile and kind of live with, especially with his mistakes. Uh, so I think that might be a potential option. Um, Pete, I don't like there's only so much we've already done with Pete. I don't know if there's anything else that's going to be done with it, but maybe um, what we might see. Uh, he, well, he did chase in after Catherine, so mm -hmm. I don't know if anything's going to happen to his body, um, but he's more likely to die than Catherine at Oof. this moment. I think you're underestimating Pete. I mean, in the game of life, he is a grand chess master. I don't know why you would think he could <laughs> let himself be fooled. <laughs> Because because he's uh, at the very least uh, very honorable. I don't think that I think honorable people live honorable lives, but also die honorable deaths when it comes to fiction. Uh, meanwhile, Kath Catherine and Shelley uh, probably still have room to grow. So, yeah, I think they'll be able to make it out of the fire. Pete either may die from that instance or in a future episode. Um, OK, so basically, listener, all you need to know is that uh, Unplugged Professor hopes that Andy and Pete die. That is all you need to take from what he just said. He wants death upon Andy and Pete. I want everyone to die to fill up the letters in my morbid circle of mysteries. It's going to be a very long word. I don't care <laughs> what favorite characters you have. I'll take them all down. Dale Cooper, Harry Truman, especially you fans out there of the Log Lady and that precious log. They all will satisfy my thirst for mystery. Professor, could you imagine if some, there's a little tiny letter inserted into the dead log? Like someone like <laughs> they stab the log and it's like bleeding. So when they get there, there's like this bloody log and Cooper it's takes out like, the knife and it's reaches just like in. The sap is just leaking out. The log lady just is just panics, calls the cops and they come and see like this log with a hatchet in it. And she says, my log, it is dead. <laughs> Somehow this cut log was not dead enough. It took yeah. the hatchet to make it bleed its final death. And then Cooper Cooper reaches in, pulls out the little white note, and and, and Sheriff Truman's like, Coop, what is it? And <laughs> Cooper's like, it's it's pie. <laughs> it's it's not even a letter. It's it's the it's, it's pie. Just pie. <laughs> pie. <laughs> and then the pie symbol goes on to the hangman board. Yeah. <laughs> Somehow Pi is involved in everything. <laughs> Man, oh, it's beautiful. an exciting game of um, Jeopardy we play. Well, everyone is in Jeopardy. Wait, that's what the J stands for. J stands for Jeopardy. <laughs> <laughs> I think we're at a good point to wrap up. Um, some some final final comments here. Uh, this was, again, out of the ordinary for our podcast. If you're tuning in and... Uh, this is your first time listening to us. This is not normally how we yep. do it. Um, but either way, whether you're a long time listener or first time listener. No, but instead, we just go on to longer rants uh, in the background for all time, if you will. Right. So if you are either a first time listener or a long time listener and uh, you happen to like this kind of video video podcast i don't know why we both do this we both think we're being watched it's a very problematic thing um 
whether whether you uh, if you like this type of podcast or you dislike this type of podcast, we'd appreciate hearing from you, getting some feedback, because this was, again, something so different. I, I think I would like to do something like this for season two. But if you guys have suggestions or requests of how we do that, uh, there's plenty of time between now and season two. Uh, if you do end up letting us know anything that involves spoilers, uh, all I ask is that you include at the top that it's going to have spoilers. Sometimes Unplugged Professor checks out the contact. Sometimes I do. So if you tweet at us, if you email us, uh, just be careful if you do give spoilers. Make sure you broadcast it for our sakes. And it makes a better pod if we do it that way. Um, again, our email is snakeeyedreams at gmail.com. And our Twitter is at snakeeyedreams one and if you haven't checked us out already, we are on YouTube as well as Snake Eye Dreams, uh, leaving us comments there, uh, reviews on iTunes, tweeting, emailing, any communication you want to do. Uh, we enjoy hearing from fans. We enjoy hearing if we got something wrong, um, even if it's to send me horrible things involving uh, the Muppet Babies. We appreciate it. I mean, in truth, uh I would be very well entertained if anyone is very insightful in the great uh, Muppet Babies lore uh, to maybe entice Khalil to check it out for himself sometime. So That's our next podcast after we're done. After we finish uh, all of Twin Peaks, all of David Lynch, then we have to go straight into Muppets. I just enjoy the fact that that will likely be more disturbing than anything else. I mean, like, you've shown me interesting cards in the past of Twin Peaks with a nearly new Jacoby, uh as a little bit of uh, introduction oh, to it. Yep, the pinup. An, uh, an introduction, if you will, uh, to... <laughs> uh, was that a fan work or was that official? I believe that's fan work. But By the way, don't quote it was fantastic, that. but still, I, I think that he has a lot of resistances set up uh, unless it is yeah. very... Muppets Babies adjacent. Maybe you'll find something Muppets Babies adjacent to talk about. If you're interested in what we're talking about, if you just Google search Twin Peaks pinups, you'll find them pretty quick. Um, just know that they do contain spoilers. I didn't send the professor any images that contain spoilers, but some of them definitely do contain spoilers of various severity. Um, but anyway, this is definitely our longest podcast so far. Again, if you like this or don't like this, please let us know. The feedback helps. Uh, we are scheduled to record our uh season two episode one podcast probably as soon as like this week where we're recording it so um if you end up saying something and we don't mention it in the next pod it's because you probably have this one recorded um <laughs> before this one even goes up you know we'll have the next one recorded before this one goes up uh we're trying to go back into the grind and uh make it work through quarantine for however long this lasts oh yeah so, yes, uh, thank you very much for listening. It was a pleasure having you guys. And I hope to prove that Laura Palmer is not, in fact, dead through season two. The only person who will be dead in season two is my dignity. Goodbye. Bye.